Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this virtual meeting of Newcastle's full council. I think it's the fourth one we've had. All members who are joining us today and everyone watching at home on YouTube, and especially to Mr. Lawrence Taylor, a member of the public who is going to be asking a question. Do we have any apologies? Yes, Lord Mayor, we have apologies from councillors Hall, Hunter, Sharon Patterson, Councillor Penny Evans and Councillor Wright. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, moving on to the minutes, does council agree the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of October 2020? Uh, Agreed. 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 Any disputes, put them in the Agreed. chat. I'm seeing that they're agreed. Okay, thank you. There are some announcements, and I'll first of all call on the Leader of Council, Councillor Nick Forbes, to make a statement regarding the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, in September, the seven northeast local authorities came together and took the unprecedented step of asking government for some restrictions. In announcing the lockdown during a press conference just last Saturday, the Prime Minister, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer uh, praised the North East for being the only region to have flattened the upward trajectory of infection rates. We should all be very proud of our collective leadership in the region. And I would particularly like to thank the residents of Newcastle for all of your great efforts and sacrifices in achieving this. For several weeks, Lord Mayor, we came under sustained pressure to move from Tier 2 to Tier 3. While we would not have hesitated to do so should our numbers have started to increase again, it was incomprehensible to me that the government refused to put a furlough scheme in place that would have guaranteed those on low incomes would still receive the equivalent of a living wage. This was the subject of many heated discussions behind the scenes. One for the memoirs when they come out. But all of that now, for the time being, is behind us. Tonight, we will enter a national lockdown. Despite government's reluctance to introduce it regionally, we now have an extension to the furlough scheme, which will protect thousands of jobs. We must now set aside our political differences of opinion and focus on doing the right things over the next four weeks. The more we can get our infection rates down now, the greater the chances of having fewer restrictions in place at the end of the national lockdown. And I know that this will be hard. Many of our residents will not be able to see loved ones or do all the things that they enjoy. We must be there to support them and we'll be making far more noise in our discussions with government if our collective voices across the city, politically, business leaders, faith leaders, community leaders, are all saying the same thing. I would like us to unite in our calls for greater financial support for our business community, for greater local control over the essential track and trace system, and for everyone to adhere to the hands, face, space messages. Fixing these and ensuring widespread compliance to the public health messages are essential if the four weeks of national lockdown are not to be wasted. We will once again, of course, Lord Mayor, be putting in place support to protect clinically extremely vulnerable residents and gearing up the city lifeline as a point of contact for residents who need help to self-isolate. I would like to pay tribute to all of those in the voluntary sector and the mutual aid groups that have sprung up around the city and thank you all in advance for the work that you're about to do over the next few weeks. I know that these restrictions are incredibly harsh and they ask a great deal of everyone after so many months of fighting the virus. But I would ask that everybody does all that you possibly can to comply and work together to put Newcastle in the strongest, healthiest position by the time they're lifted. Please stay at home as much as possible. Don't mix with other households and do your bit to protect our city. We will be far stronger in the future if we work together as one now. Once again, Lord, I'm asking all Newcastle residents to show the spirit, generosity and empathy that has got our city through difficult times before. We have made incredible progress in dealing with the pandemic already and must keep on battling the common hidden enemy of COVID-19. Thank you, Lord Mayor. 
Thank you, Councillor Forbes. We move on. On behalf of Council, I would like to congratulate all those with a connection to Newcastle who were recognised in the belated birthday honours list this year. Remembrance Sunday is a time for people to reflect on the service of our armed forces, to pay tribute to the veterans who fought in World War I and World War II and the conflict since, and to remember those who gave their lives for our freedom. It is with regret, although not unexpected, that plans for Remembrance Sunday have had to be changed dramatically this year. I hope that by next November we'll be living in more certain times and that all members, military, veterans, members of the public, will be able to come together for the traditional parade and, parade and service. However, this year we are asking people to stop what they are doing and observe a two-minute silence at 11am on Sunday the 8th of November and again at the same time on Armistice Day on Wednesday the 11th of November. We're also encouraging people to send us their tributes to share on social media and asking them to display poppies in their windows, doors and gardens. A pre-recorded wreath laying ceremony will be shown across the council's social media pages. Finally, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Patrick Tracy, the civic officer to the Lord Mayor and Sheriff, who left the council yesterday. This will be of particular important to former Lord Mayors who are in the meeting. Patrick has worked for the Lord Mayor's office in Newcastle for over 17 years. During that time, he has worked, of course, with 17 Lord Mayors. His background in the military prepared him well for this role in the Lord Mayor's office. He's driven Lord Mayors to events in Newcastle and the region, always getting them safely door to door and on time to the exact second with military precision. A civic officer, Patrick has guided Lord Mayors and Sheriffs through the processes and formalities of a wide range of civic and ceremonial events and has carried the mace and sword as necessary. Now, as you will know, we Lord Mayors can be a troublesome bunch, but Patrick has always supported us with good grace and has been as good an ambassador for the city as we all have tried to be in our time of office. He'll be sadly missed and we wish him well in whatever the future may provide for him. So thank you, Patrick, and good luck. If I can move on to item four, uh, correspondence. Does council agree to receive the two letters from the Home Office and one from the DWP? Agreed. 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 Any dissent, put it in the Agreed. chat. Agreed. I don't see any. Thank you. If I can then move on to item five, petitions. Uh, one petition has been received this month, and I'll call on Councillor Postlethwaite on behalf of West Jesmond Primary School. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the petition reads as follows. Um, we petition Newcastle City Council to implement a school street for West Jesmond Primary School on Tankerville Terrace and part of Brenton Wood Avenue South as a matter of urgency. The school street is a road outside a school with a temporary restriction on motorised traffic at school drop-off and pick-up times. The restriction applies to school traffic and through traffic. The result is a safer, healthier and pleasant environment for everyone. There are now lots all around the UK, but none in Newcastle. The aims would be to one, make space for social distancing, two, increase safety and three, encourage more walking and cycling. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Postlethwaite. I'll call on Councillor Ainsley to respond. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Postlethwaite, for bringing this petition to Council on behalf of the school. School streets are something we see as not only being positive, I go as far as to say that they, are, they form an essential part of our transport policy in the coming years. We acknowledge this when we ask the government for funding that they unfortunately decided not to give us. Um, we do have a problem with simply introducing school streets in as much as while the government may encourage their use, they haven't given us the appropriate powers to implement them safely. We are unable to enforce school street restrictions and currently would require the police to do so. I'm sure you'll understand that the police can't commit to resources to this at present. Some authorities have got round this by asking volunteers to stop vehicles driving through, but I'm not prepared to implement these measures on the basis 
that we rely on volunteers potentially putting themselves in a position of conflict with other people. We've made some changes outside uh, West Desmond Primary School, uh, which addresses the additional space to enable social distancing. And I've actually received some emails from parents to thank us for doing that, um, because that formed the basis of, of some of the uh, arguments for school streets, which, of course, as I'm saying, we support. Um, I will continue to lobby government um, while it's also continuing discusses with the, discussions with the Police and Crime Commissioner in an attempt to resolve the situation. And we will implement school streets as soon as it's, as it's safe to do so. Again, I thank you for this petition, which, while it's focused on one location, brings attention to some of the major inequities we face in not having the same powers as authorities in London and Scotland in delivering these excellent initiatives but we will continue uh, to lobby so that we can implement school streets as soon as possible. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lorraine. So we'll move on to public questions and addresses. There has been one request to address Council uh, this meeting. Um, can I invite Mr Lawrence Taylor, who I know has joined us, uh, to ask a question relating to cycle infrastructure? Mr Taylor. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I uh, appreciate you having me in these difficult times. Um, a councillor once said to me, as a councillor, if you're looking for thanks, you're in the wrong job. Well, I'm uh, going to break with tradition here. Uh, I'm old enough to remember traffic on Northumberland Street. I remember cars charging up and down our house, uh, outside our house in High Heaton. I remember when I was 17, seeing how fast I could drive along Jesmond Dean Road. Now, all of these roads are now car free. So I want to thank every councillor and every officer over the past 40 years who stuck their neck out and put measures in, sometimes taking abuse from car drivers to keep our children safe and to make Newcastle a far more pleasant place to live and to bring up kids. So are we, uh, are we done then? Well, no. As Tony Benn said, the battle is to be fought over and over again. So what's next? Well, let's imagine there was a magic transport network in the city. Imagine if anyone, no matter how rich or poor, could drive into town, park right outside any shop, nip in, buy something, nip out and drive to the next shop. Go to a restaurant, all your friends can park outside for free. Imagine Percy Street free flowing with thousands of people going up and down it instead of a continuous traffic jam. Imagine halving journey times across the city centre. There's my office next to the Civic to my solicitor on Westgate Road, takes half an hour by car, metro, or, or even by walking. Now imagine that reduced to 10 minutes. Well, we've tried this in, with cars in the 60s and it didn't work. Uh, the problem is that cars uh, take 135 square foot when they're parked and 480 when they're moving. That's the size of a small shop. It's fine in the countryside or a little market town, but they clog up cities and they harm the economy. People don't like to shop on Gosforth High Street because of the noise and the pollution of all the traffic. But imagine if there was a new transport network that we could put in that could fit 10 times as many people in the same lane space, that could fit six times as many vehicles in each parking space, that would put 128,000 people in Biker, Heaton, Jesmond, Gosforth, Fenham and the West End, 12 minutes away from every shop, restaurant and activity in the city centre. Imagine the boost to the city centre economy. What? Tens of millions? Well, it's not a secret, is it? It's cycling. It's not a fantasy. It's been done. Utrecht in Holland is similar size to Newcastle. Now, I didn't know this, but they used to have dual carriageways right through the centre. They dug them up, put in bike lanes, new houses and a canal. And now they've got 51% of journeys in the cities on bikes. And the city centre economy is booming. They estimate 250 million euro a year economic benefit. It's the same in Amsterdam, in Copenhagen. The efficiency of cycle transport in cities is unbeatable. And Newcastle is missing out. Now, I'm keen to set up a shop selling electric cargo bikes for families. Put your kids in the front, take them to school and carry on to work. But why would I invest 150,000 pound in a shop selling family bikes in a city where almost none of the convenient routes are safe and pleasant for families to cycle. 
Now, the idea of good junction design is putting my kids in a green box in front of a line of angry traffic, where most of the city centre is a no-go area for families on bikes, and where the only bit of protected cycle infrastructure is 400 metres of gold-plated road to nowhere down John Dobson Street. And the answer is because there's huge potential here. Newcastle has large flat areas and it's got high population density. It's absolutely perfect for cycling. And I'm seeing some really encouraging signs, seeing all the school children cycling over Stonyhurst Bridge, seeing a new bit of route outside the Civic Centre, seeing Councillor Forbes' vision of Grey Street come true. But I'm nervous. I mean, this is a big risk for me and it would help a lot um, with budgeting to know how ambitious the council actually is. So these are my questions. Do council see cycling as a serious transport mode taking 40% of journeys or as a niche activity with maybe up to 10%? Do council see the economic benefits of good cycle infrastructure or is it just seen as a nice thing that we we'll ought to be doing to tackle climate, air quality, obesity and inequality? Are council prepared to install safe, convenient, continuous protected routes through the city centre along key streets like Percy Street and Blackett Street? including through junctions and past bus stops, or will we only see a couple of extensions to John Dobson Street? Thanks very much for having me. I'll call Councillor Ava Ainsley to respond to that, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Mr Taylor, for taking the time to, to come along this evening to address Council. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for the recent emails that you've sent uh, to me to add your support to our uh, work on low traffic neighbourhoods, um, which, you know, are, are, are springing up all over the city. Um, colleagues and those listening um, will will hear um, a lot from me tonight um, that, you know, and some of what I'm going to say when I present my report later on the agenda should go a long way to addressing your questions. Um, the annual report um, contains more details about our commitment to things like low traffic neighbourhoods, as I've already mentioned, to un underpin improving our communities. But to directly respond to your, que your questions, yes, we see both walking and cycling as a serious, a serious transport mode and recognise that among the most important ways to ensure it is considered as such is to design infrastructure that young people, older people, and really importantly, women, feel safe to use. Um, I've consistently told our engineers um, that we, we shouldn't just be designing for, um, and I'm, I'm, I apologise in advance if I upset anyone, but we shouldn't just be designing for middle-aged men. We should be designing for younger people, older people, and as I've said, more importantly, women. If our city set network is designed for the young and the old, and takes into account the specific concerns for safety, um, then everyone else would be able to use it. Obviously, there are, there are econ economic benefits to having good walking and cycling infrastructure, um, along with the environmental and societal benefits. And, and an example of that was when uh, Blackett Street was, was closed to, to traffic um, as a trial period over a couple of summers. And the businesses on on um, on Blackett Street actually saw an upturn in their sales over the periods that it was that it was closed. So there are we are aware of the economic benefits to providing that active active travel uh, network. We're working to deliver safe and convenient and protected routes in the right places. It's not about just providing X some extensions. It's about creating a network. And that approach aligns with the City Council's approved ambition to create a safe network that connects every school to every park to every shopping centre. We really have that, that commitment to create that, that network of safe cycling routes and, and walking routes across the city. So I hope that's, that's answered your questions, Mr Taylor. Thank you. And thank you, Lord Mayor. Mr. Taylor, you've now got the right to respond for up to one minute, please. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Angley, for that. Uh, that's fantastic. This is, a, this is a quote from Clyde Lokes, Labour councillor from Waltham Forest. Our plans for low traffic neighbourhoods and protected bike lanes provoked rage, protest and the use of four letter Anglo-Saxon words from a 500 strong group. But guess what? Come the election, 
I got the largest majority I'd ever had. This is popular. 73% of people in Newcastle want to see space taken from cars and given to bikes. Let's get as many people into our beautiful city centre as we possibly can. We've got the architecture, the museums, the cathedral, the castle, the bridges. Let's not restrict ourselves to buses and metro. There's a lot of car drivers who don't like waiting for a bus, who want their independence, who want guaranteed quick journey times. And this is what cycling offers. This is how we get them out of their cars. Let's make Newcastle a world-class city centre. And let's give it this transport network that it desperately deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. If we can now move on to item seven, which is the presentation on the impact of COVID-19 on public transport, I'll now invite Tobin Hughes, Managing Director of Nexus, to address Council on the impact of COVID-19. Members will be able to ask questions uh, following the five minute presentation. And may I ask that uh, uh, all replies be given at the end. So over to you, Tobin. Well, good evening, Lord Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, as you say, I've been asked to give a short update of the impact of COVID-19 on public transport. As I'm sure many of you will appreciate, circumstances and regulations are changing all the time. And it's not impossible that what I tell you this evening might well have changed by tomorrow. But I will start with ridership and usage. Now, before COVID-19 came along, we would have expected to see over half a million people using public transport on a typical weekday across the northeast region. 100,000 of those would be on metro and the rest on buses. The first lockdown period had a profound effect with only key workers traveling for 12 weeks. And so ridership plummeted to between five and 10% of normal levels. And then as the economy began to reopen, this began to climb steadily so that by late summer, we were back to between 50 and 60% of normal ridership by the time schools reopened. It's worth saying that the reliance on public transport in the Northeast is high. And so our public transport ridership bounced back more quickly here and to higher levels than in many other places in the country. The vast majority of the missing trips are mainly in the traditional rush hour as office workers continue to work from home. This is undoubtedly a long term change in behaviour and will con continue to be the case for many months, if not years to come. One of the few bright spots, though, of course, was an increase in active travel modes. And Mr Taylor, I'm sure, will be pleased to hear that cycling increased in the region by well over 50 percent during the summer. And even now, in the dark, slippery autumn, it is still 45 percent up on where it would have been this time last year. Unfortunately, as local restrictions were reintroduced from October onwards, ridership on public transport began to decline again. During the second lockdown, we expect it to decline to between 20 and 30 percent of normal ridership. Although it must be said, after an unexpected surge this week, arising from Christmas shoppers and other last minute activities before the lockdown begins overnight tonight. I'll now say a quick um, few words on hygiene, social distancing and face coverings. Public transport operators have invested heavily in extra hygiene measures like extra hand cleaning, hand sanitizer dispensers on stations and buses and reminders to passengers to wash hands, leave space and leave windows open wherever possible. I'm sure many people will know that wearing a face covering on public transport became mandatory in May. And although we have very high levels of compliance overall, well over 90 percent of passengers across all services, certain groups have been hard to persuade. And that has led to lower levels at certain times and in certain places. We do everything possible with information, extra staff and in partnership with the police to persuade people to comply. And we have asked the government to consider giving enforcement powers to some Nexus staff so that they can issue penalties where necessary. It is important, though, to remember that not everyone can wear a face covering and some people are exempt. Public transport staff have performed magnificently throughout the pandemic. Like other key workers, of course, they can't work from home. And I would like to take this chance to publicly thank all of them. 
We've worked very positively with staff and trade unions to make sure that workers have the correct equipment and environment to keep them safe. Absence levels have been higher than usual due to shielding and self-isolation, but the impact on operations has been relatively modest given the scale of the pandemic. And now for the impact on funding. After some persuasion, the government has agreed to provide emergency COVID funding to both bus operators and Nexus for the Metro to enable services to continue operating. And we're in, the discussion, we're in discussion with the government now over what this means for the long term, because for as long as social distancing is in place, any bus or Metro train is only able to carry around half as many passengers as it used to. And COVID-19 restrictions on economic and social activity will of course depress income even further. The region has submitted a recovery plan to the government dealing with transport and digital connectivity. And that was endorsed by all of the councils in the Northeast, the two combined authorities, the local enterprise partnership and the local business community. As part of that, we've requested the continued support of government throughout the pandemic to keep services going, as well as half a billion pounds worth of devolved transport funding so that we can deliver major transport improvements over the next five years. And that, of course, is because public transport is essential to keep the local economy moving, to help achieve climate change targets and to make sure that people in all walks of life can access jobs, education and other opportunities. We need public transport to be here for the long term. And so we need investment right now to enable that to happen. Thanks very much, Lord Mayor, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tobin. There are a number of members who've put down the, uh, the questions. I'll start with Councillor Avery. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my question is about the impact on of COVID on long-term funding for infrastructure expansion and um, network expansion. Um, and what impact, if any, it's had on um, bids for government funding uh, and the sort of the long term plans for the Metro rather than uh, the more short term aspects. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Stone. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thanks Toby, for the report. And uh, I obviously applaud the efforts of uh, staff in keeping the public transport system going. But I think we have to recognise that COVID um, has had effects both on passenger numbers and on driver availability. My, my question touches on the issue of long-term funding. Um, we know that we have been getting getting emergency funding from government on a month, well, a three month, you know, week, week by week, month by month basis. The issue from my perspective, longer term, is what this means in terms of um, public transport availability going forward, given that we know that um, Nexus's budgets are uh, facing deficits in the years to come. Uh, and I know that the issue of cuts to private transport services has been talked about. I was wondering if you could give an indication of when you expect to have more information on what that will mean in terms of possible, possible public transport cuts. Councillor Fairley. Uh, hello, thanks, Lord Mayor. Yes, um, I was uh, I was going to ask um, with public transport just being reserved for um, essential journeys only. Um, do you think this is having an impact on uh, people's access to the city centre for those people who live too far away to be able to uh, walk and cycle into the city centre? Councillor Higgins. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my and, and thanks, Mr Hughes, for the very helpful presentation. My question relates to school travel. Um, as you're perhaps aware, for some time we've been working on school travel plans to encourage greater use of alternative, form, alternative forms of travel to school other than by motor vehicle. This has both, both health, health and environmental benefits. These plans appear to have been undermined by some schools cancelling school buses due to concerns about social distancing. Um, are any of the bus companies being encouraged, perhaps through Nexus, to provide extra buses so that schools can still have school travel by bus and can also abide by the social distancing requirements? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thanks. 
David Wood. Okay, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you very, very much for the presentation, Tobin. And uh, I wish you well trying to get money out of this government. You and I both know too well how difficult that is. The, the disadvantage of coming uh, at the back end of questions is that the, the questions you want to ask have already been asked. But what I would say, Tobin, is that I hope you would take the best wishes of this council and pass it on to all the staff who, go, who have been going that extra mile and uh, give them our best wishes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you for that, Councillor Wood. Uh, I've got no one else indicating they want to comment or question, so over again to you, Tobin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so to work through the questions, the long-term impact on funding for infrastructure projects and the Metro in particular, um, well, of course, many things are hanging in the balance as we await for the spending review results. Um, the spending review, as we understand it, uh, there will be an announcement later this month, but we also understand that for most cases, it will only be a one year spending review. And some of the long term certainty that we would have been hoping for um, perhaps is less likely to be forthcoming as a result. Um, but that said, there is positive news in regards. Uh, we were successful earlier this year in securing um, £104 million worth of Transforming Cities Fund, plus funding for um, expansion of the Metro in a project known as Metro Flow, which will increase the capacity of the system and allow us to increase the frequency. The Metro train fleet funding is secure and the project is well underway um, with the uh, reconstruction of the South Gosforth based depot about to begin. Um, and uh, as I mentioned in, in my uh, presentation, we have submitted a request to the government as part of a recovery deal, uh, secu uh, requesting a long-term funding settlement. Um, at this point, of course, we don't have any confirmation of that, but we will continue to make um, requests to the government because uh, building better infrastructure for public transport and for active travel, going to the previous discussion, is hugely important to get this area back on its feet economically as well as leading to better health outcomes, reduced congestion, um, better air quality, and hopefully reduced inequalities for everybody. Um, Councillor Stone was asking about the uh, long-term funding, uh, I think more on the revenue side, and whether we could expect funding cuts. Um, again, in my presentation, I, meant, I did make reference to the discussions we're having with the government about long-term uh, funding. Uh, now, the Metro has always required long-term funding from the government. COVID has just made that need more acute because we are, whilst there are fewer people travelling, earning less money from fares. Um, we do hope that the government will be persuaded to put in place a long-term settlement that would lead to COVID-related losses being made good. But until we've completed our discussions with them, we don't know that. They have requested that we develop what they call a recovery plan with them uh, for submission by the end of December. So perhaps the next uh, seven weeks will provide the answer to Councillor Stone's question. We don't have any intention to reduce metro services or frequencies over the long term. Um, I should say, because of driver availability, we will shortly introduce a slightly reduced frequency over the winter period. Um, but that's a short term measure to do with staff availability and not a reflection of the service levels that are needed. Um, however, all members of the council, I'm sure, will be aware, but they certainly need to be, of the acute pressure on funding, not just for the Metro, but also for buses. Um, and as we look into the long term, we do need to come up with a sustainable plan. Uh, Nexus, um, as part of the budget process for the Joint Transport Committee, has submitted its proposals, or sorry, is formulating its proposals with the Joint Transport Committee at the moment. Um, I think we intend for next year to have a stable position, but we will probably need to look at what service levels should be over the longer term across all forms of public transport that require public funding um, over the course of next year. So uh, at this point, I don't have a precise answer, but as we head over the course of next year, we should get more um, information. A councillor Fairley was asking about uh, access to the city centre from people who live outside it um, and whether there 
um, dis discouraged from travelling on public transport because of um, essential journeys only. The, 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 it's a, it's a, it is a constant discussion that, that Nexus and other transport operators has had with the government about the messaging about the use of public transport. Um, I need to be clear, public transport is safe, it is hygienic, and it is available to all. Um, however, sometimes the restrictions that the government makes um, on people's movements in order to control the spread of the infection inevitably means that there are different types of travel permitted at any given point in time. Um, the lockdown period, the first lockdown period, it was for key workers only, um, and that probably undoubtedly discouraged people from traveling, but frankly, there was nowhere for them to travel to. So it was all part of a combined package. More recently, um, while the economy has been more open, uh, there are no restrictions on public transport. That will change tonight again, where the government is saying that um, obviously many non-essential shops and uh, leisure sites will close. Um, public transport is available for anybody who needs to travel, but the government message is that travel should be limited wherever possible. So we're pleased that the message is not targeting public transport anymore, but the message for the public is during this next lockdown period, people should limit travel to only where it is necessary um, for obvious reasons. Um, Councillor Higgins was asking about school travel. Um, school travel was uh, a very difficult planning exercise this year as we prepared for schools reopening. Um, social distancing uh, was a concern, there's no question, but I'm very pleased to say that working very well with the bus companies and using additional government grant put forward by the Department for Education, um, duplicate school buses were put on wherever they were needed. Um, it is true to say that individual schools in some cases felt that they didn't have a demand for school transport and that is their right. Uh, schools will know their parents and their children better than we can. But uh, as transport operators and as Nexus, the PTE, wherever there was demand, there were sufficient school buses. And uh, what was a very tense period in late August leading up to schools reopening, I'm pleased to say, proved to be uh, um, unnecessary caution because actually the schools restart process went really very well. And I'm not aware of um, any cases where children could not get to school on the school bus. Every year there are small individual isolated cases that we take up with the parents concerned. And finally, thank you very much, Councillor Dave Wood. I will pass on your best wishes to uh, all of the transport staff. It is much appreciated from you and from uh, your colleagues on the council. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Toby. Uh, and on behalf of council, I would like to thank you very much for joining us this evening. So thank you. If we can move on to item eight, this is the uh, uh, procedural arrangements, decision-making arrangements in relation to a cross-boundary planning proposal. Now, as members are aware, this is a report about whether the council should agree to determine a planning application on behalf of Northumberland County Council. This is purely a procedural matter. It's not about the planning merits of that application or any other application. Those planning merits are matters to be considered by the planning committee, and I would remind members that they should not be discussed at this meeting. So I'll now call on Councillor Bell to move the report, which I understand is to be seconded by Councillor McCarty. Councillor Bell. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, with the introduction, I'll not take up very much more of your time because you've actually said exactly what this proposal is tonight. Um, section 101, subsection 1 of the Local Government Act, it lays out uh, in there that a local authority may arrange a discharge of any functions by another local authority. To support that national planning practice guidance, paragraph 178, states that public bodies have a duty to cooperate on applications that cross boundaries and borders. As you said, a live application site is almost wholly in Newcastle. It's 112 hectares in Newcastle boundary compared to just 100 square metres in the Northumberland boundary. Like yourself, I must stress that this is a decision is purely a procedural matter. 
The decision as to whether any final application is accepted is the sole responsibility of the planning committee. So, Lord Mayor, I ask Council to accept the recommendations as laid out in the report. Thank you. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to formally second this, um, this procedural report. Lord Mayor, thank you very much. I've had no indications of anybody wishing to speak on this, uh, this uh, arrangement. Uh, if, if there is anyone, please indicate now. I'll give you two or three seconds to do so. Okay. Councillor Bell has nothing to reply to. Uh, so I'll uh, uh, ask Council, do you agree the report recommendations? Agreed. 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 And you please put it in the Agreed. chat. Okay, I'm not hearing any dissent, so uh, that arrangement uh, is agreed that uh, uh, Newcastle will determine the application on behalf of Northumberland County Council for, as regards that very small area which Councillor Bell referred to. Moving on to item nine, which is the pay policy statement for 2021-22. I'll call on Councillor McCarthy to move the report uh, and it's to be seconded by Councillor Jackie Robinson. Councillor McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Before I go into the details of um, the contents of our pay policy statement, um, I think, Lord Mayor, as the leader of council has done tonight, um, could we, on uh, behalf of the whole of council, thank our staff for the huge amount of work uh, and support that they have given to each other and to citizens of our city um, through what has been a, an extremely challenging year. Um, Lord Mayor, the report that is before us tonight is fully focused on um, fair pay. Um, Lord Mayor, we have a duty to provide information and this uh, council has tried to provide open and transparent information. Um, we have already had a full discussion before this uh, pay policy statement was agreed in constitutional committee um, and the recommendation from them is that this report be agreed by City Council. Um, Lord Mayor, this annual report, which we must share, it's part of our statutory responsibilities, ensures that we are um, uh, accountable, transparent and fair in relation to uh, public sector pay. Um, colleagues across the Council will know that we've paid our staff the Newcastle living wage for many years now. We were the first in the region to address the uh, issue of living wage. Um, and more recently, we've caught up with the Foundation's real living wage um, also some years ago. We do still offer a supplement, uh, as colleagues will see, um, for a very few staff numbers who are not actually earning the real living wage um, so that no one who's employed by this council gets anything less than the real uh, Foundation living wage. Um, and Lord Mayor, we will hear next week, next week is living wage week, we will hear next week what the uh, proposals, the foundations uh, for, for living wage, um, their proposals will be um, uh, released next week for the uh, salary levels for the living wage for the, for the next financial year. Um, Lord Mayor, the report that is before us also sets out our gender pay gap analysis. Um, as the report says, um, we uh, didn't have to share that this year. We were given some flexibility um, because of the pandemic, but as, as the work had already been done and it was easy to include, we have made th that statement um, transparent. Um, and I would like to remind Council that we have no role apart from um, as part of consultation in the NJC pay and grading arrangements. Um, as I say, Lord Mayor, we are consulted on that process, but it is an independent body who makes those um, suggestions to all public sector organisations. I'm also really pleased that we've moved ahead on single status with the craft workers. Um, uh, I think uh, that demonstrates our good work with the trade unions and that um, our working arrangements um, and collective bargaining uh, work with managers are appropriate and effective. Lord Mayor, this administration has always tried to set out the information in an open, accessible and transparent way. 
Um, there are some at council tonight who might want to criticise aspects of that policy, and of course, um, that is their right. Uh, I do want us all to recognise, though, that as good employers, we want to do more than just pay our staff. We want to support them. We do offer benefits. They're set out in the report, Lord Mayor, tonight. Um, so car schemes, bike schemes, support for childcare, as well as um, we have demonstrated support for the trade union campaigns, such as the uh, TUC's Great Jobs Agenda and Dying to Work are a couple of examples of campaigns that we have supported and, and uh done all we can to make sure we are doing our best to support staff who work in the council. Um, we do also offer our staff significant levels of training and, and those opportunities, Lord Mayor, are offered at all levels of staff in the authority, um, often during work time when it, when it is therefore supported by us as um, an employer. The report sets out governance arrangements through constitutional committee for any posts in the city council at assistant director or above. Um, and Lord Mayor, just a couple of facts from the report. Our median pay is around about £24,500, where the average in the North East is £27,700. So uh, clearly um, we are still below uh, the regional average. Um, the report also, Lord Mayor, refers to councillors' allowances, and that's not part of our statutory reporting duty. But again, because we want to be open and transparent, it is included here in the report. Um, the, law, the Lord Mayor, the gender pay gap is set out on page 54, and for the most part, that represents good news. Certainly in the top three quartiles, we're doing quite well, although it is disproportionate in the lower quartile. Um, I do think that's a reflection of working women often need the flexibilities that are offered um, for when officers work in the local authority. So term time working, part time hours uh, obviously influences the opportunities that um, are included in working uh, in a local authority. Um, Lord Mayor, just to finally close by saying we, we do really um, want to thank our staff uh, for all that they've done, particularly this year, it has been a very, very difficult year, I think, for all of our staff and services have continued to be provided um, as far as possible. And can I recommend this report to Council this evening? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I formally second the report. There are a number of members who have indicated they want to comment. So we'll start with Councillor Higgins. We'll take all the comment. Well, there are there are questions and comments. So Councillor Higgins. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. And can I thank uh, Councillor McCarty for this report and particularly welcome our continued commitment to our lowest paid staff through the Newcastle living wage as a part, vital part of our pay policy. However, my question relates to the salary awarded to our chief executive and other senior officers of the council. In view of the fact that the performance of the chief executive is appraised through the chief executive appraisal panel, comprising the leader himself, the deputy leader, and the leader of the opposition, which agrees any pay progression, then does Councillor McCarty share my view that recent criticisms of the chief executive's salary by the leader of the opposition and others in his party are not only disingenuous, but somewhat hypocritical? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cott. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and uh, and thank you very much, uh, Councillor McCarty, for your update, your qualitative overview of uh, some of the issues. I thought was uh, was very revealing and uh, very useful. Um, and we too are very supportive of a number of things you've mentioned, particularly around the gender pay gap, around the living wage. Um, and efforts uh, that you are making to uh, improve the uh, equality and diversity in issues for staff. And of course, that we have the uh, Stonewall Awards uh, that we've been very successful with in the last few years. So I think that's all very positive. I have one particular question about that. Uh, we've talked uh, a lot this evening about the contribution of staff during this crisis, and I would like to put on record my thanks to all members of staff um, right across the organisation. They have been working incredibly hard at this time 
home, um, there may of course be particular issues that they are experiencing in terms of balancing work and life issues at this time. And I wonder if there's any uh, special um, mention you could make of anything uh, that's happening to assist them. Um, yes, we are aware, of course, that all of this, uh, the, the bands, the scales are, are set out uh, against a national pay scale award. And we are aware of that. And uh, Councillor Higgins has, has raised a point uh, in relation to my perspective and the perspective of our group. What I will say is what we've said in the local media uh, in relation to this. We recognise that this is a national pay scale award. Uh, we recognise also the contribution, the very valuable contribution of the chief executive and directors. Um, we, the point we made was actually around the timing um, of this uh, particular announcement. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, the uh, deputy leader can take on board uh, this particular issue, because of course, there are lots of people uh, who are suffering out there at this time. We have people on reduced income, threat of unemployment, unemployment, and we have council cuts. So there's a lot of things that are going on. We will certainly be supporting uh, this report as an opposition, but uh, I just make those points as they've been raised this evening uh, by another member of council. So thank you very much. Council Holland. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, I'd like to welcome this pay policy statement, uh, which was agreed at the Constitutional Committee, of which I'm a member. Um, as, the, uh, as the committee is made up of 13 uh, cross-party councillors, I have to say I do agree with my colleague, Councillor Higgins, that I was somewhat surprised then to um, see the criticism in the press um, about pay awards, which has already been stated are already national awards. Um, it does seem a little bit hypocritical to do that um, on one hand and then and not raise that in the committee um, and then go outside of the meeting and then criticise it to the press. Uh, I agree our council staff, especially our senior management team, have been absolutely outstanding during this pandemic. They've dealt with it efficiently, effectively and with a, the utmost care for, all, for staff as well as residents of this city. That, of course, is all in addition to doing their day job. So I do find the additional question tonight posed about timing um, also very puzzling. Why, why would we stop processes just because we have a pandemic? Uh, these are national conditions. People deserve the right to be paid um, just in the same way as everybody else has awarded their pay scale. So I don't think timing is an issue. Um, and I think to um, actually make it an issue is very disingenuous. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Lower. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord Mayor, I'm a member of Constitutional Committee and I just want to say, Joyce, I welcome the report. We had a full and frank debate about this. I think people need to realise that the national pay policies like Christmas, it comes around once a year and we are, we are told what we have to do. Um, Whilst it may have not been the ideal time to announce this, I do feel that we do not have to take anything away from our staff. We, from the directors down to the frontline services, they are all pulling together to do best for us and the city, and they are a great representative of this council. Um, we can't say to people what they do with their pay rise, what how much they, but we have agree to do it. I, I, I think it's quite disingenuous to say that talked about is not being given. I think that a lot of people were concerned about the fact that the government decided to do this in August and then make the announcement now. Um, but for my part personally, I think the directors who have been some of them away from families, who are working weekends and evenings and responding to everything, are doing a fantastic job. And it's to come through, it's something that we should be debating about back to the bad old days when I picked and chose who got pay rises. I think this is a much better scheme than what we used to have, where officers were awarded depending on how their face fitted rather than how they actually did their job and how good they were. So I think that we're, we did a good job. It's unfortunate that it came and people have debated it, but there is nothing we can do about it. It's a national scheme and we are signed up to it and they're getting what they deserve. Thanks, Lord Mayor. 
Councillor Forbes. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Just a few things to add uh, uh, to the debate tonight around the report, which I think uh, is a very clear and uh, 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 progressive statement of this council's approach to pay policy. Uh, as I raised in constitutional committee, but, but hasn't been mentioned yet by any other members, uh, one of the things that comes through very clearly in this report is the huge amount of work that goes on with the trade unions. And uh, the trade unions, I think it's fair to say, are part of the uh, grease that uh, lubricates the machine of the council and enables uh, uh, the smooth running of staff side relations in a way that is very mature and very sensible. Uh, and it's only when you look at other authorities uh, and the conflicts that they get into with their trade unions that you realise actually how mature the relationship is here in Newcastle. And of course, the trade unions add a huge amount of value, not just in terms of the direct working of the council, but the additional learning support that they provide uh, to uh, their members. Uh, and again, I think we have a really positive uh, story to tell about the extraordinary amount of work that goes on in Newcastle to invest in the staff of this authority, not just from the council, but from the trade unions too. And uh, uh, people have touched on the gender pay gap. I very much hope that in future we'll report on other equalities pay gaps, because uh, although this meets our statutory requirements and uh, we've used this to highlight the issue of uh, gender pay gaps uh, for a while now, clearly we also need to make sure that we uh, broaden that into the wider equalities framework that we operate within as a council. And I hope that in future we'll at least look at uh, ethnic uh, re reporting on pay so that we can at least understand a baseline and start to address the undoubted challenge that we'll have around that in the future. And finally, uh, Lord Mayor, I just want to comment on the uh, rather willfully misleading comments from the Leader of the Opposition uh, around uh, the uh, senior director's pay. He knows full well, as he stated tonight, that it's a national pay award. He knows full well that the Council has no choice in paying it or not. He knows full well that we have no choice in the timing of that award, and yet he seeks to highlight this to try to make a political issue in the height of a crisis where our senior directors team, along with other staff across this organisation, are working seven days a week, and I know this because I see it myself, seven days a week to keep communities in the city st safe. You talk, Councillor Cott, about respecting the staff in the organisation. Well, why don't you show some respect for a change instead of just talking about it and keep your clap trap shut in the future when it comes to commenting on pay issues about which clearly you're going to be disingenuous and two-faced about, as always. Uh, Lord Mayor, uh, I could continue uh, in this vein, but my concern is that uh, broadly, uh, we as a council have a very clear, open and transparent approach to pay, which um, of course attracts the headlines. That's the nature of being the city in the region. It's also the nature of being the most open and accountable and transparent council in the region. Uh, but I'm not going to hide away from this. I think this is uh, the right thing to do. And as members have commented on, uh, it is uh, 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 really important that we understand our approach to pay and are transparent with that with the public. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Forbes. I would ask you to refrain from making remarks of, of the nature you did during that speech you, you just gave us. Um, Councillor McCarty, would you like to reply? Thank you very much, um, Lord Mayor. I always feel it's a pity in this discussion um, that so much focus is on the pay of our senior staff. Um, and I agree with um, Councillor Higgins and Councillor Holland um, and the Leader of Council um, that actually some of that comment is disingenuous and hypocritical. Um, Lord Mayor, um, so thank you to colleagues for questions. I will pick up um, a couple of the issues that have been raised. Um, uh, Councillor Cott asked about special arrangements uh, in relation to work and life uh, balance uh, for our staff. 
Um, Lord Mayor, I can reassure Council that uh, any member of staff who is needing to shield or is needing support because they're caring for someone is being um, uh, supported by managers in this organisation. Of course, it depends on which part of the Council uh, they work in as to how much support we can offer, but we are doing our best as an employer to make sure that um, members of staff uh, can fulfil their caring requirements. Uh, you know, as many of us will have seen, Lord Mayor, when we get uh, replies from officers across the council who are replying to us late in the evening because they're working flexible time in order to look after their children through lockdown, um, as one example, or they're caring for older relatives who need their support. So we have tried to um, do that. Um, Councillor Cott also asked about the timing of this report. Um, Lord Mayor, we tried to bring this report in the um, during the year so that it doesn't get, um, I, I want to say ignored. If it came at the end of the financial year alongside the whole budget documents, uh, actually it wouldn't be properly debated or properly considered because it would be drowned out by all of the information within the uh, formal budget uh, papers that we bring. So, um, uh, you know, the timing is uh, purposefully set out so that we can have a proper debate about what are really, really important issues. Um, uh, I very much welcome Councillor Lower's comments. I think she's absolutely right that we did have a full and frank discussion. Um, and uh, you know, I agree with her uh, that the staff in this council are doing a fantastic job um, and welcome her comments about the national scheme. Um, Lord Mayor, in, in relation to the Leader of Council's comments, um, I think I will share with Council tonight that I have written to the uh, to Gavin Williamson, the Secretary of State for Education, because he has cut funding um, for Union Learn. And I know that many colleagues who are aware of the support that Union Learn gives to our staff across the Council, that cut is, um, are, are in my view, totally wrong. Um, to be fair, I think I wrote to him a couple of weeks ago and I've not yet had a reply, um, but the, the uh, regional TUC and the national TUC are very, very pleased that we as a council have supported uh, their campaign to bring that funding back. I think that is a huge loss, um, uh, potentially unless he can change his mind. Um, Lord Mayor, I'm um, very happy to support the uh, report that is before us. Um, once again, thank all our staff. I think colleagues have recognised how hard our senior team, or indeed all of our staff, have worked through uh, lockdown, uh, but particularly the senior team who often haven't had a weekend in order to recover, um, which would be expected in work. And we do also, Lord Mayor, have a duty to look after them too. Um, I recommend this report to Council. Thank you. Does Council agree the recommendations in the report? Agreed. 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 I'm not hearing any dissent, so that is agreed. Uh, if we can move on to item 10, there is one report referred from Cabinet, and that's the Treasury Management Mid-Year Report. And again, I'll call on Councillor McCarthy to move to be seconded by Councillor Jackie Robinson. Thank you very much, um, Lord Mayor. Again, this is another report that we um, must bring um, to City Council um, to for City Council to note. Um, Lord Mayor, this report has been through Cabinet and has been scrutinised uh, there as well. Um, Lord Mayor, this report summarises the Treasury management activity in the first six months of this financial year and updates the prudential indicators. Um, the page of triple A's and um, all of that detail uh, is all there in the report and I know that colleagues will have read that very carefully. Um, Lord Mayor, the, those um, prudential indicators were agreed in March of this year um, in line with our um, most up-to-date information on capital expenditure and our financing. Um, in terms of external loans, Lord Mayor, there's been a reduction of just over six million since the beginning of the year. And by the end of the year, we're expecting that total to increase to just under £800 million based on current plans. Of course, Lord Mayor, we're all aware that capital spend can go up as well as down because it will depend on weather and, you know, and in construction, for instance, lots of things were delayed through the course of this year as well. 
Um, Lord Mayor, that figure of just under 800 million is well below the authorised level that Council has agreed of around about 960 million. Um, and the um, maturity profile of the debt is in the report in paragraph 4.3. Um, Lord Mayor, in terms of external treasury management investments, um, they total 125 million um, at the halfway point through this year. Um, they are almost certainly likely to reduce to 10 million by the end of the year based on the current uh, capital spend plans. Um, lastly, Lord Mayor, the report sets out the performance against the prudential indicators that we agreed in March of this year. Um, and if you look at paragraph 4.11, the only indicator that's slightly above target is the one related to the affordability of the housing revenue account debt. Um, we're expecting uh, that uh, to change over the course of the year and it will be therefore reflected in the HRA budget which will uh, come to uh, Cabinet later on. Um, Lord Mayor, I ask City Council to note the um, Treasury Management Performance Update for this year. Um, and approve the um, investment criteria that are set out. Uh, and apologies, Lord Mayor, that I think appendices A and B um, came out late, but that you uh, council members all have access to them now. Um, and maybe finally, Lord Mayor, just to say, um, as a councillor, I cannot answer operational questions of councillors, um, but I'm very happy to uh, respond to um, strategic comments that colleagues have. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I formally second the report. Councillor Ferguson has indicated he would want to contribute. Councillor Ferguson. Um, th thank you, Lord Mayor. No nothing from me actually on this instance, but thank you anyway. Okay, is there anyone else quickly wishes to comment, speak? No one? So once again, Councillor McCarthy has nothing to respond to. Uh, so uh, does Council agree the recommendations? Agreed. 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 I'm not hearing any dissent. No. So we move on to uh, uh, item 11. Right. Okay, I th we've, we had a slight glitch there. The recommendation was agreed. One written question was received this month and the reply is included in the items circulated for meeting pack. Moving on to item 12, uh, it's a cabinet member update. Um, uh, there are two of them. The first one, on transport and air quality. And I'll call on Councillor Ainsley to introduce the report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I'm delighted to bring this report to Council this evening. As we all recognise, this has been a challenging year and one that none of us could have anticipated. Who would have thought that after meeting the challenges that over 10 years of austerity has brought, we'd be hit by a global pandemic and the impact that that's had on all aspects of people's lives and the economy? The main challenge for the transport team has been to make sure that our city is kept safe and safe for residents to move around in by providing adequate space for social distancing as well as increasing space for active modes of travel. This hasn't always been as easy amidst ever-changing guidance from government. Some of the changes have met with some opposition and I find it quite ironic that while the majority of people will acknowledge there's a climate emergency and agree that we need to improve air quality, some of them are critical when we introduce changes that address these issues, as I think Mr Taylor eloquently outlined earlier this evening. One of the most important things we can do to improve public health is to design our streets to promote active travel to design our streets and neighbourhoods so they prioritise people and not motor vehicles. It's important that our transport network serves the city and its people. Our policies are not anti-car, they are pro-people. 
When we submitted our air quality plans to government earlier this year, it was intended to implement the plans in January 2021. As we all know, this implementation has now been delayed. And contrary to some of the statements, um, I won't use the word claptrap, Lord Mayor, made to the press by the opposition, we continue to work with our neighbouring authorities to achieve this. And our dialogue with, with government also continues. Though I have to say it's rather disappointing that government's funding offer of 20 million is significantly less than the 93 million we asked for to implement the scheme. It would be remiss of me to introduce this report without paying tribute to our staff, as many of colleagues have already done so this evening. It's important that we all recognise their hard work and dedication, especially in a year when they've all gone the extra mile to make sure we continue to deliver our services during this pandemic. And I want to place on record my thanks to them all. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Councillor. A number of people have indicated they want to speak or question. I'll start with <coughs> Councillor Fairley. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Lord Mayor, and thanks, uh, thanks for the report. Um, as I say, you know, there's one very large omission from this report um, that hasn't hasn't been mentioned. It's, we're actually in the middle of what is probably the largest piece of transport infrastructure investment that this city has seen in many, many years, because uh, reconstruction is well underway on uh, the rebuilding of the uh, the A1 Western Bypass. Now, I realise that this is a, a Highways England project and it's paid for with central government money, but it's got big implications for the city because it, it cuts right through the, uh, the middle of the city and cuts us in two. And the city council is responsible for um, the, the connecting roads and paths either side and for the communities either side. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, to what extent is the City Council engaging with Highways England on this project? And specifically, um, an issue that I've been raising for many years is, is, uh, is access across the A1, because to my knowledge, every footbridge and underpass on the A1 between Scotswood and Brunton has steps making them inaccessible for wheelchair users, um, cyclists, uh, and, and anybody uh, anybody with restricted mobility. So what is being done by the council uh, to improve access across the new rebuilt A1 by getting these, these footbridges and underpasses that are currently not um, Disability Discrimination Act comply and what are we doing to ensure that neighbourhood communities are no longer cut off from each other on either side of the A1 and what has been done about cycling infrastructure for the outer west of the city so that we are no longer uh, cut off and can be connected to the rest of the city. Right, thank you. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, opposition councillors um, have been made aware of a number of instances where uh, residents have been unable to um, receive um, refunds on the fines um, that were levied incorrectly at John Dobson Street um, for odd reasons, um, private number plates not being recognised. Um, we gather um, in one instance that lease cars not being recognised. Um, and, and various other issues. Um, given those issues and the understandable frustration that residents feel over the whole John Dobson Street debacle, um, does Councillor Ainsley feel that the tone that she's taken in response to the Chief Adjudicator's damning verdict is appropriate in this report? Councillor Higgins. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I first of all thank Councillor Ainsley for her report and and also thank Councillor Ainsley for the fortitude that she's showing at the moment with her portfolio because it must be one of the most challenging on the council with so many contentious issues around so congratulations on the way that she's uh, standing up to things. Um, it, my my act, question actually segues quite uh, quite nicely into the question there from 
um, Councillor Ferguson, but perhaps with a slightly different aspect to it. So I'll just read my question out if I can, Lord Mayor, related to John Dobson Street. I know that in a recent press statement, the leader of the opposition accused the council of trousering the fines imposed for the misuse by motorists of the John Dobson Street bus lanes. Would Councillor Ainsley therefore like to reiterate the importance of bus lanes in the city with regard to our clean air and public transport strategy and also respond to the suggestion by the leader of the opposition that the money accrued through these financial penalties has been misappropriated in some way. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen with us. We'll move on, come back if she is. Sorry. Uh, Are you with us? Yes. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Sorry about that difficulty. Councillor Ainsley, on page four of your report, you mentioned the new one-way system on Northumberland Street. Now, I've used Northumberland Street quite a bit recently, so I support this one-way system, especially it's, it's been so busy the, the last week or so. But I've become concerned about the number of people who either aren't seeing the arrow markings or are mm -hmm. ignoring them. So I'd like to ask if you've been and had a look at the system in action on Northumberland Street. And if you have, are you looking to see how the system can be improved for the future to ensure that people understand the one-way system and also that cyclists realise they shouldn't be cycling on this street. But I've also been concerned to hear that street entertainers have been attracting crowds on Northumberland Street in spite of social distancing rules. So what has been done to address this issue as it's been worrying some of our residents? Thank you. Councillor Avery. Thank you, Lord Mayor, uh, and thank you, Councillor Ainsley, um, and all of the officers uh, involved in the, the uh, department for an excellent report. Um, the uh, experimental traffic orders that have allowed uh, additional cycling uh, have been really, really uh, useful and, and helpful, and, and I've had uh, the great pleasure of using them both on foot and uh, as a cyclist, and I think they really have made a really significant difference uh, to the city, not just in COVID, but uh, hopefully um, pending the sort of legal and, and procedural niceties, that that's the sort of thing we'd be able to see more of in, in the city in, in lots of different places. Uh, my question is whether you could say a bit more about joining up those specific uh, bits of infrastructure, both for cycling and walking, um, into a city-wide system and more about our, uh, our ambitions to, to join up uh, systems uh, and to have them work across the city, because there's nothing more frustrating, I'm sure Councillor will know and would agree, than uh, walking or, or cycling on a really nice bit of path and then reaching a part where you artificially have to stop, apparently, uh, sort of for no reason, and what more we can do to, uh, to overcome that. Thanks. Councillor Kane. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Ainsley, for, for producing this report. Um, I'd like to break with tradition and uh, agree with uh, Councillor Avery there, um, because this is a point I've been making uh, for, for many months. Um, the, in 2012, we all voted uh, on a, um, across the chamber to support a cycling strategy which set out the kind of joined up network that Councillor Avery has just uh, discussed. And uh, there's no mention of it in this report. So my question to Councillor is, has it been abandoned, particularly in light of her reply to my written question last month, uh, which rather suggests it had in favour of low traffic neighbourhoods. And then on the, the low traffic neighbourhoods and 15 minute city issue, um, the report uh, explains the concept very well, but it doesn't really set out what progress has been made to implement these and whether there's any deadlines for implementation uh, to get the government funding. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Stone. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, a couple of questions for Councillor Ainsley on this. 
Firstly, uh, relates to the government's emergency active travel fund um, second tranche, which I uh, understood was about to reach um, a decision and announcement on what funding the region would get. I know that we have the council has plans for um, Grey Street and Queen Victoria Road within that, and I was wondering if you could get any updates on what she had heard from the government about what funding we might or might not get. Um, and secondly, um, I note the council is seeking to um, introduce an e-scooter pilot scheme in the not too distant future. Um, I recall, as I'm sure Councillor Ainsley does, um, our uh, test drive in the, the city to in the car park some time ago, and I, I can I can see that they're, they're quite fun to use. Um, I do have some concerns, um, particularly given we've got the darker winter nights here in terms of safety. Uh, I was wondering if she can give any assurances on what she thinks the how safe the the um, the new arrangements will be. I'm particularly asking in light of her comments on the the school streets uh, in terms of enforcement um i could i can anticipate a situation where people are trying to use these on pavements and i was wondering what guarantees you can give about enforcement by the council or by the police to prevent that council cot thank you very much lord mayor um thank you very much councillor ainsley uh, and first of all um Thank you very much for the recent contact we've had with you around issues around Gosforth High Street and the Great North Road. Um, and I just want to say I hope that's the start of a very constructive discussion uh, with you and ward members. And, and I just want to thank you for attending. My substantive question is actually related to that in part. Um, it's about low traffic neighbourhoods. I'm very interested in these. Um, the impression that we gain from officers is that uh, we put in a list of schemes and uh, there isn't a particular uh, criteria which is used which I find very hard to believe. I know there is a criteria because I've actually subsequently found this out but can you just clarify exactly how these uh, schemes, these suggestions will be judged on what criterion will uh, these schemes be uh, evaluated and what will be the chances of success? And thank you, Councillor Ashby. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Um, the uh, 20 mile an hour speed limits uh, are, are an integral component of, ha of low traffic neighbourhoods, um, but without enforcement, they, they do bring the concept into disrepute. What's the Council's policy on working with the police on enforcement and monitoring and the installation of automatic speed indicators on principal roads within such neighbourhoods? Uh, and on the subject of e-scooters, the trial of e-scooters, uh, can you tell us, is there any hire in the wings? And do they know of the previous experience with the hire hirers of pedal cycles? Thank you, colleagues. Uh, Councillor Ainsley, you've got 10 minutes to reply to those comments. Councillor Ainsley. Sorry, Lord Mayor, I, I forgot to unmute. Um, such is my keenness to um, to answer these questions while they're still fresh in, in my mind. Um, Councillor Fairley asked about uh, the Western Bypass and, and yes, of course, we're engaging with, with Highways England um about this we, we appreciate that the a1 a1 does appear to split the city in two and um you know we, we work very hard to to bridge that if you like and we will be looking at the um access you know you're talking about the inaccessible access for for pedestrians and cyclists um to cross the a1 we will will be looking at that um, your comments about cycling infrastructure in the outer west. Um, we ha we have focused um, a, a lot of the the cycling infrastructure in on on the main um, commuter routes, if you like. Um, but we will be looking at at those um, at at, at in increasing the infrastructure in the outer west. Um, John Dobson Street, uh, Councillor Ferguson asked, uh, mentioned about um, accessing the fines. I'm only aware of, of one, um, one, one person's got in touch with me and I put in touch with the head of parking services 
um, and 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 it was it was going to be sorted out. So um, if anyone, you know, please ask them to get in touch, um, and and we'll try and sort them out. I'm really not not sure why that there is a problem, um, because we've already issued in excess of seven thousand claims um, quite successfully. Um, Councillor Ferguson questioned my tone. No, I don't think my tone is inappropriate. We had strong, strong grounds for a judicial review following the findings of the Traffic Penalty Tribunal's review, which took an astounding three years to complete. Despite that, we took a pragmatic approach to what a pro pragmatic approach to offering refunds to people who received the penalty charge. And I want to make it absolutely clear that regardless of, of some of the uh, misinformation that's been circulated, there is no legal obligation for us to offer refunds. We have, as we have consistently upheld DFT requirements. So based on that, um, you know, on, on all of those issues, I don't think my tone is inappropriate. I think we're being more than fair with people. Um, Thank you for your comments about my fortitude, Councillor Higgins. Um, I have required some uh, in light uh, in light some of the changes over the last few months. And again, as Mr. Taylor uh, quoted um, earlier, you know the the, the councillor in London who um, got several got well was slated, but then um, increased his majority when he stood for re-election. Um, yes, there, there were some comments about us uh, trousering fines uh, from from John Dobson Street, and I'm not quite sure what what that what is meant by that, because as we all know, the fines that are collected are ring fenced to to for traffic to go towards transport improvements, and so they will be uh, used for exactly that. There's not a case of secreting the money away or misappropriately using uh, funds. The fines that we have uh, collected um, will be used on um, on transport improvements, whether that be in the city centre. We've talked earlier this evening, um, you know, when I received the petition about the the government's um, refusal to fund uh, and to give us the powers for School Street. Maybe we could put some of that towards that. I don't know. I'm not saying we are, but it is ring fence to um, to transport uh, infrastructure. Uh, improvements. Uh, Councillor Allen, the one-way system on Northumberland Street, yes, I, I was there um, just yesterday, actually, um, not doing my Christmas shopping and not stockpiling, but there uh, on, on Northumberland Street. And I, I, too, noticed people ignoring the markings. And I did witness the COVID marshals who were standing at either end of the street um, actually challenging people. I only passed, or only one cyclist passed me yesterday because, uh, as, as you know, that is that is again one of my bugbears, and uh, I usually challenge them, but um, you know they, they still continue to ride their bikes. Um, and street entertainers, um, as far as I'm aware, we don't, we haven't issued any licences for street entertainment during lockdown or during this period of COVID. So I will ask ask our enforcement officers to to you know seek to investigate that for you. Um, Councillor Avery um, about the um, experimental experiment tra traffic regulation orders. Um, I'm pleased to found the significant significant difference they've made to the city. Um, we have, as I explained earlier, um, um, you know, a, a commitment to to um, linking, making links for these active active travel routes, whether that be cycling or walking routes, to link every school, to every park, to every shopping centre. And I think that that's a really good um, good sort of policy to stand by. You know, we need to make sure children can get very safely from home to school. And if they choose to go to the park later on, then, then you know, so there is a policy of, um, of joining up the infrastructure. A lot of it is funding dependent, as, as we already know and, uh, and have talked at length about this evening. Um, the low traffic neighbourhood, the cycling strategy, uh, sorry, Councillor Kane, I, we haven't abandoned it as a strategy, but we, we have developed it and, and are looking at, you know, 
things have moved on since 2012. Um, and, and so we are looking within that cycling, and I hesitate to call it a strategy, but, you know, the low traffic neighbourhoods and the 15 minute city, we're making progress on that. Um, I'm not aware of any deadlines, although I know there is one for the for the funding, and I can't quite recall the exact date, but I will get back to you on that. I'll just make a note of that. Councillor Stone, um, the um, sorry, I've, I've I've written the Emerging Active Travel Fund and Queen Victoria Road and Grey Street. Um, we are in dialogue with government. I don't know any further detail on that at the moment, but I will get that and, and get the detail to you. Um, the e-scooter pilot, I'm, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm, the concerns that you raise um, are similar to the concerns that I, I had and, and, and still to a certain point have. Um, We've put everything in place during the procurement exercise to make sure that they will, you know, behave legally. That is, they can only operate on the highway. They must have lights and, um, you know, act, act in legal. There's a, there's a list of criteria that they have. Um, so, of course, the concerns that, are, that I do share the concerns about safety, but we will be carefully monitoring that. We've done a lot of work with Newcastle Vision Support on this because they also raise concerns and, and so we are working with them about that. Um, Councillor Ashby, you also asked about e-scooters and compared them to the Mobike trial. Um, they, are, they are different in, in as much as by the very nature that the e-scooters, they have to be regularly charged and so cannot be left kind of lying around. I'm not sure on the scheme that that will be ultimately uh, given will, whether people will be expected to return them to a docking station. I haven't got that level of detail, uh, but again, I can I can get that, that level of detail to you. Um, Councillor Cott, uh, yes, it's, it's, I, I, think, I think that's kind of the way we've been working about, you know, the, the, the meetings we've had on about Gosforth High Street. Um, you know, it's up to, to councillors to come up with, with suggestions for low traffic neighbourhoods and 15-minute um, and neighbourhoods within their wards. The engineers in the transport department will, will then look at, at them and assess their... Um, you know, evaluate their, their potential success so that there is criteria. And, and I think by having an open and an ongoing dialogue with all council, with all councillors about their own areas is the way that we can we can judge the um, best judge the uh, success or otherwise um, of that. And I think the final question um, from Councillor Ashby was about 20 mile per hour speed limits. Uh, and of course, as we all know, count, uh, 20 mile per hour speed limits are, are, are there for the, for the safety of, of everyone, uh, including drivers. And um, yes, we, we will continue to work with the police to make sure or, 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 or to, to you know, ask for their support in enforcing these. And I think I did within my 10 minutes, Lord Mayor, and I think I've answered just about all the questions, although I am aware that I do need to get back with some further detail on some of them. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, you have time exactly. Thank you very much. Just <laughs> Councillor Steve, the report. Agreed. 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 Thank you. Agreed. 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 Not hearing any dissent. So there is a, a second um, um, uh, member update, and that's on housing. Uh, I'll call on Councillor Hobson to introduce the report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And before I start, I just have to apologise. I've got two quite anxious dogs uh, with me at the moment with all the fireworks going off. So I do apologise if, if, they, if they interfere with me giving the report or answering any questions later. Um, this report, like others we've recently um, been receiving, is heavily impacted by COVID and in relation to housing, COVID has brought into sharp focus how important a home is, how we use our homes and for some of us it's meant shielding, for some of us it's meant 
learning how to homeschool or to adjust to working from home and adapting how we use our home to our new way of, of living. And as we approach another lockdown, we're also reflecting on the importance of our local environment and how important access to open spaces has been too. And as well as being a public health crisis, COVID is also a social and economic crisis too. The economic impact is being felt within the homes of our tenants and residents across Newcastle. Many are navigating the welfare system for the first time and many facing job losses. Within Newcastle, our aim has always been to prevent job loss and debt turning into homelessness. And this report shows some of the success that we've had. And that's due mostly to the excellent partnership work and across the city as we make homelessness prevention everybody's business. There is a lot of focus within the report on our support for the most vulnerable, which I'll make no apologies for, be that our support in preventing homelessness and supporting those sleeping rough into accommodation and further support, or why it ends um, you know, monumental efforts during lockdown and beyond, the welfare calls that they've made to tenants who are shielding, addressing social isolation within the residents too, or our private rented service continuing to support landlords and tenants within the private rented sector. And all of this and more, and it's just, as I've mentioned in the report, is a great testament to the value of local government. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to those staff who are so often the unsung heroes of public service and being a public servant in the NHS, I know that who have gone beyond and will continue to do so for the people of Newcastle. As I've said, we've got a good record in preventing homelessness and supporting those sleeping rough within Newcastle. Years of austerity, government funding cuts and changes to the welfare system are making sustaining this more and more challenging year on year. However, we have an ambition to end homelessness, not just to prevent it, but in ending it with the Newcastle and aim to do this by building on our excellent partnership, working and the relationships that we already have within the city. Our relative success has achieved national and international recognition, and we will continue to use research to inform our practice. We have the highest rate of homelessness prevention of all the core cities, and this has attracted investment, not just from government, but additional funding like that through our partnership with, homeless, with the homeless charity crisis. Obviously, the first lockdown led to the construction of new housing developments being halted. However, we are assured that this will not have a major impact on our council funded or our commission sites. And in taking a collaborative approach to housing, um, we see that in working with YHN, adults and children's social care were able to better align our resources and our service provision and this allows us to deliver the best offer of accommodation that best meets the needs of our, our residents. And we're focusing on housing with support rather than just supported housing. We continue to do what we can to prevent our new housing stock being sold under the right to buy. We're supporting the Housing First initiative and continue to acquire land and review our assets for house building. And we will continue to fund, we will continue to bid for funding from all sources, for example, the North of Time or North of Tyne or from Home England to deliver on our ambitious house building plans. There are significant challenges for us in relation to cost, cost pressures on our housing revenue account as set out in the report, and we will be reviewing our housing um, revenue account assets to ensure we have a plan to deliver the housing we need as a city. Obviously, energy use from home, homes accounts for a third of Newcastle's carbon emissions and significant work is needed to address this. And housing is a crucial, crucial part of our net zero action plan. But action is needed not just by the City Council and YHN. Action is also required by government through regulation, by builders and raising, raising standards and private landlords and all of us as individuals. Within Newcastle, I believe we have a a record to be proud of in relation to housing, but we're always striving to do more and to do better. I'd like to thank the members of Overview and Scrutiny and the officers I will work alongside. And Lord Mayor, I present my report to Council and I'm happy to take questions. 
Thank you, Councillor Hobson. There are a number of people have indicated. I'll start with Councillor Holland. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Hobson, um, I don't like to bring up Brexit, but I'm going to. <laughs> Given that the Brexit withdrawal deadline is fast approaching, what support are we able to give our council housing tenants and their families who are EU nationals? Thank you. Councillor Hoddart. Uh, th thank you, Lord Mayor, and um, thanks, Councillor Hudson, for this uh, for this report. Um, a couple of things. I'd also like to give my congratulations to the staff for the extra duties that they undertook during the first lockdown. You know, driving people around, delivering food, checking on elderly people, etc. Uh, that was all very valuable. Also, the setting up of the emergency housing panel was was a brilliant stroke, and I understand has been copied by other councils, and and they've dealt with some of the most needy people that we had in the city. That's been uh, excellent, as well as working with crisis. I used to work with them years ago, and they're good people. So I have a couple of um, questions here. The first one really is about selective licensing. Um, it has been affected by lockdown um, and, and obviously the process has been slowed. So when do you think it'll be fully operational? And if I can add to that to say, when do you think we'll also catch up with the disabled facilities grant stuff, which is also running slow? And my next question really is about the private rented sector and evictions because you mentioned this um i think about a month or so ago in in one of your reports and the situation seems to be worsening so i wondered if you'd give us a bit of an update on what the council's doing to help prevent any further evictions and people being made homeless by this thank you Councillor Hazel Stevenson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Hobson. I would very much like to um, support your report. Um, I would very much also like to commend the staff, as you've already done, but in particular, a number of staff in the team in Wyachen who are constantly cleaning people's gardens and have continued to do so and clearing out properties during the first lockdown right through right through all the time and presumably will be continuing to do that um they have been you know everyone can see them around but certainly they do a tremendous job in all weathers and it's not a very uh, savory type job if you like in the sense that some of the things that they are having to um to do to prepare the homes for people going in, which is very important. But my question um, is around the small scale modern method of construction housing sites that are being developed around the city. And I would just like to know a little bit of what we've learned from those and if there are any plans to extend these. Thank you. Councillor Stone. Uh, I'll wave my right, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I'll, I'll pass this time. Thank you, Councillor Stone. Councillor Jackie Robinson. <laughs> thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd also like to thank Councillor Hobson for this report. Um, just to get things moving, just one question. What impact do you think the planning white paper will have on our local plans for our housing developments within Newcastle? Thank you. Councillor King. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. And could I take this opportunity to also, sorry, thank uh, Councillor Hobson for her report and also thank um, Wyatt Chen for their efforts uh, during the, the the COVID crisis and particularly in Oosburn Ward um, during the, the recent surge in cases there because um, they, they were very, very helpful and, and dealt with a number of issues. Um, my question, I was pleased to see the section on climate change at the very end of the report. Uh, but I've been trying to unpick the details a little bit. 
uh, because there are various figures quoted. I assume those are national figures and the the, the amount that Newcastle is getting is the the 1.1 million at the end. So I was wondering uh, for some views from Councillor Hobson on how far she think that thinks that 1.1 million might go in terms of um, helping decarbonise the housing stock in Newcastle and how far it will get us towards our 2030 target. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And finally, Councillor Ashby. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Hobson. Um, new homes, including affordable ones, can't be built without skilled people. There's already a shortage of craft skills in the city. What's being done to press government to attach monies for training to any allocations they make for construction? And what consideration has the Council and the North of Tyne Combined Authority had about underpinning apprenticeships in their own organisations? Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, Councillor Hobson, you've got something like 13 minutes to reply. I'll unmute first. That should be a, a good start. Um, Councillor, uh, Councillor Holland um, talked about EU nationals. Um, from there's a deadline of um, the 30th of June um, next year. Um, when those EU nationals have to um, apply to the government's um, set, um, set, settlement scheme. Um, and if they don't apply by then, then, you know, they're at risk of things like, you know, lo losing their home, coming into, entering into homelessness. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pleased to say that YHN have recently um, registered as an immigration advice service. Um, so they can actually work with, uh, where well, they can actually um, work with their um, residents or tenants to um, to give them advice on how to on how to do this. So and, and you know, in effect, preventing people from entering into homelessness. So you know, that's a. I think the the know that they've got 820 tenancies that are held by um, EU nationals. Um, and that's you know that's a massive risk to us, but they're not doing it because of the risk to us in mental income. They're doing it because it's absolutely the right thing to do, to give support, um, to give to support support to our tenants. Councillor Hoddard, um, in um, this in terms of selective licensing, it has been halted. Um, obviously, COVID has played a, a big part in that. We weren't able to employ the staff um, and to get them um, into position in time to uh, meet the deadlines. Um, it, you know, um, priorities have been elsewhere, um, rightly so. Um, I do not know the date when selective licensing will become fully operational. Um, and I would imagine that that's going to be something that we're just going to have to keep a, a watch and brief on. It's not when we're not um, falling back from it at all. Um, we are still working and have been working more uh, more recently in getting those landlords to sign up to the uh, to sign up to the scheme and work through that. And we will continue to do so. In terms of the disabled facilities, that um, the um, we have employed more people to get through those um, those cases because obviously with COVID, people shielding, whatever, didn't want people to come into their properties, um, rightly so. They are now being given the option because some of those people, even though shielding ceased, are still vulnerable and still might not want people into their, to come into their homes. Um, so they're given, they're, they're given an option, but those numbers are coming down significantly, um, which is great to see because more resources being put into there. In terms of um, the private rented sector evictions, uh, the eviction bans, a ban as we know that ended in September. Um, at that time, it was said that in, when people were in local lockdown situations, that, um, that you know, it wouldn't be enacted on, there'd be a Christmas um, grace period given, but not what we were calling for, which was to extend that. 
Um, I don't think the communication that has been coming out from government since Boris announced um, the, the lockdown that starts tomorrow has been good enough for those renters either. They're left in limbo, wondering what's happening with them. He's extended the furlough scheme. They've extended um, the support to homeowners, um, but private renters have been left out, uh, left out of it, and I think that's a disgrace. Within Newcastle, we've got the private rented scheme, and that has been working. Um, you know, as I mentioned um, in my introduction, that has been working throughout, and will continue to do so. It has been helping not just those, not just renters. But it's also been um, helping landlords because we know that if we can prevent somebody from becoming homeless, it is easier than then dealing with that tragedy of that person becoming or that family becoming homeless. So whatever whatever support we can do to prevent somebody or a family becoming homeless, then we will absolutely do that. Um, Councillor Stevenson mentioned about um, modern methods of construction. And obviously, modern methods of construction doesn't just mean one thing or one item. It's there's a range. Uh, there's a range of items that can be used. We've got um, a, a site in Elswick, a modular um, build site in Elswick, and we've got some more small schemes um, in in the in the pipeline. Um, we've been looking um, at the work that Home Group have been doing. They've got a variety of schemes going on, and we're part of a part of a, um, a group um, across the, the region looking at how we can learn from uh, these, um, these these builds, what they're telling us, um, whether, whether they do what they say they do before we actually invest our money into, um, in, into upscaling, um, upscaling on a scheme. Uh, in particular, but uh, you know, it's it's really exciting to um, to see um, these developments coming on and the people moving in, making them their homes, um, and seeing what can be what can be achieved there. So um, then I had a question on the housing white paper. Um, I've, I've made my um, I've made my views known um, very clearly in cabinet meetings recently over what I believe, what I think of the the cabinet white, uh, the the housing white paper and its potential impact on on not on housing where within the northeast it's very much skewed towards the south and building houses um, and against us. It goes against our local plans. We have experts. Um, who you know who have done detailed work in setting out what our local housing plan is and what our need is i've got real concerns about um you know the section um 106 money and and, and how that's going to be uh going to uh, going to go and be replaced um and you know we know that when when the government say things like that and normally it normally means that we've got less money coming our way so i'm really concerned about uh, about you know we've got some very ambitious plans for housing within the northeast and I just think that you know not just that but also the impact it's going to have on the ability for our residents to participate in the planning process. Um, to um, the question from Councillor Kane about the climate change figures, um, it's very simple um, answer to your question I think is that it it's absolutely goes nowhere near the amount of money that we need. Um, as I said, when I set out in my uh, introduction, um, the housing, um, you know, housing is play, has to play a significant part in achieving our net zero and um, small pots of money are all well and good. Um, and we will absolutely take every pot of money that we can um, but a significant uh, amount of money is going to be needed um, to bring our housing um, stock, not just YHM's housing stock, um, but the city's housing stock um, up to standard. Um, what else? What have I missed? Anything out here? Um, a question on construction work as an apprenticeships. 
Um, um, I'm not sure um, that I know enough about um, what happens with um, count the anyway. We have a you know, we support our apprent we are very pro apprenticeships. Um, I'm sorry, I can have fireworks going off and my little dogs get starting to shake, but um, we very much support apprentices and anything that we can do to help um, and to um, encourage local businesses or national businesses who do any form of construction for us to invest in local people to take on apprenticeships and develop their skills um, in the construction industry. You know, that is what we will absolutely do um, because there is an absolute skill shortage um, within the construction industry or the building industry at large. Any one of us who's trying to do any kind of work on, their, on, on, on a house or a home, um, from a personal point of view, can, can uh, test for that, let alone anything else. And we need, we need these prop, properly trained um, and well-paid jobs um, for, for the people in, in our region, absolutely. And I think I've answered all the questions. I'm not. I'm not sure, but I think I have. I think you have, Councillor Hobson. But if anyone is satisfied, no doubt they'll approach you by email. Thank you very much. So, does Council agree to the uh, receive the report? Agree. Thank you very much, colleagues. Let's move on to the appointments. Are the appointments agreed to set out on the supplemental agenda? Agreed. 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 No defence, thank you. So if we move on to motion, uh, a request has been received for the next two motions on free school meals to be covered by a single debate. If council agrees to this, each motion would be moved and seconded individually before moving on to the single debate, followed by an individual vote, or individual vote, I should say. Does council agree to that course of action? Agreed. 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 Right, I'm not hearing any dissent from that. So I'll call on Councillor Morrissey to move the motion uh, to be seconded by Councillor Cock. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I am proud to move this motion, but I would like to start by thanking the many volunteers across the city, which probably runs into hundreds for the valiant effort and support in preparing, making and delivering food to children last week to help prevent what has become that abhorrent freeze, holiday hunger. I would also like to thank officers and staff for their hard work in meeting extremely tight timescales to have lunch bags ready to go out on Monday. It was a very well coordinated effort appreciated by the families. I felt proud to see the banqueting suite full of people with a common purpose and humbled when mainly mothers, but a couple of dads on receiving the bags, tried to say that they weren't feckless parents or that they hadn't chosen this way to live. And they were so very, very thankful for what was a sandwich, some fruit, crisps and a bottle of water. Having sufficient food every day is a basic human right for all children. Unfortunately, on the TV, we see children in countries across the world for whom this is not the case. And many of us support work to help ensure children are fed. However, during our last half term holiday, there were children here in Newcastle who did not have access to the free mid midday meal they are eligible for and entitled to. Due in part to central government failing to fund this properly, but also to the response of the Labour administration. On Thursday afternoon, the 22nd of October, this council had no plans to provide lunches to children who were eligible for free school meals due to lack of funding. Following a press release from the Liberal Democrats calling for these children to be provided with a midday meal, but after schools had closed on Friday for half term, the administration suddenly found the money it didn't have 24 hours earlier. 
and set the train in motion for lunch bags to be prepared. Out of a very recent figure provided to me from the Civic of 14,700 children eligible for free school meals, only 900 lunch bags were given out each day, just over 6% of children who were entitled to them. However, on a positive note, we do know many children received food from other sources, communities, community groups, sporting associations, residence associations, individuals and businesses who themselves are in, in uncertain times at the moment, stepped up to the plate and in some cases provided hot food. This is what we're renowned for in Newcastle. We look after our own. We help when needed. We give when we have very little ourselves and we go that extra mile for the bains. And doesn't it make your castle a wonderful place to live? However, feeding children should not be a lottery. It shouldn't rely on the goodwill of neighbours or strangers. It's the responsibility of the local authority to ensure the most disadvantaged children do not become further disadvantaged by a less than optimal system in providing nourishment. In no way is this meant as a criticism to the sterling efforts and hard work of everyone involved. However, had this been a better coordinated approach instead of a reactive piecemeal one, then perhaps more of the 14,500 children would have been better fed last week. Thank you. Councillor Cott. Councillor Cott. Hello. Uh, yes, Lord Mayor. Sorry about that. It's it's slow. Um, I reserve. Uh, I second the motion and reserve the right to speak. Thank you. I'll call on Councillor Forbes to also move the motion on free school meals and holiday hunger. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, can I start off uh, like Councillor Morrissey, uh, expressing a huge debt of gratitude to everybody who stepped forward. Uh, in the aftermath of the government's vote uh, against providing free school meals during the holiday period with offers of help across our city. It's important to remember that this was a campaign led by Marcus Rashford that resulted in the outpouring of offers of help from people in a whole range of walks of life from businesses, local community cafes, community groups, voluntary sector organisations and so on. We saw an outpouring of offers of help and support with people determined that they were going to do their bit because the government was walking away. And the council uh, at very short notice stepped in to help coordinate these efforts and of course make sure that uh, those families that didn't have any other option were able to register for a free school meal and have one delivered by a, a team of volunteers. And I want to pass on my grateful thanks to all of those people too. It really was a Team Newcastle effort. Uh, the city at its very best, showing what it does in difficult circumstances with a really strong commitment to ensure that no child went hungry in the October half term. But Lord Mayor, we have to ask ourselves why that was the case at all. Why is it in a rich country where food is plentiful, do so many people suffer from holiday hunger? Why is it that child poverty leads to this situation? Our government, should feel very ashamed of itself for having turned its back on the thousands of children around this country who rely on free school meals to get them through the day. We've all heard stories from our local schools, particularly our primary schools, about children who are unable to concentrate because they come to school hungry. Children who are the only meal they get in the day sometimes is a pack of broken biscuits that they bought on the way in from the corner shop, other than the, of course, the, the meal that they get in school. And I cannot understand why the government dug itself a massive hole and refused to get out of it by 
uh, refusing to support the extension of free school meals, which was not, of course, an unprecedented thing to do because they did it for the Easter school holidays through a voucher scheme in the middle of the COVID crisis. Our argument was, why couldn't they do it again? And I'm very proud that our city stepped forward uh, to uh, uh, into the breach. But Lord Mayor, I think that holiday hunger, children requiring free school meals is simply a symptom of a much wider scourge of child poverty in our city. And one of the things that saddened me was the number of people who on social media and in commentary said, oh, this isn't political, just feed the children. It is deeply political. Child poverty is a direct result of cuts to income support, cuts to the welfare state, the fact that wages haven't kept up with rising living costs, worklessness, the high costs of housing, the dismantling of many of the safety nets that have been part of the post-war settlement in this country for years. Child poverty is deeply political and its roots, its causes are in the inequitable political system that this government and the coalition government before it put in place. So yes, we should be proud that our city fed the children in that time, but we should also be absolutely determined to campaign to lift their families out of poverty in the first place, because that's the only way that we'll avoid having to come forward with sticking plasters again in future. And my motion doesn't just congratulate people and thank them for their support. It says that if the government isn't prepared to step forward in the Christmas holidays, then we should start preparing contingency plans now. I know that there will be an outpouring of support from our city because that is the generosity of the Geordie spirit, particularly at a time of year like this. But if we do have to uh, ensure that children are fed, let's make sure that we coordinate this effort across our city. And once again, the council will be prepared to step in uh, if there are gaps in what is on offer for people. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish we weren't having to do that. But it's incumbent on all of us to ensure that no child goes hungry in this city. We've, shoot, we've shown that we can achieve that. And sadly, I fear we may have to show that we can do that again over the Christmas holidays. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor McCarthy. Lord Mayor, can I second and reserve the right to speak in the debate? Thank you. Thank you. We'll now uh, move to this single debate over these two motions. Uh, starting with Councillor Schofield. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as we've heard, the 14,700 children in Newcastle qualify for free school meals. That's equal to the population of Berwick. Quite a thought. Um, and it's right that we're debating this emergency motion tonight, challenging the government's rejection of calls to introduce free school meals during half term. But this cruel Tory rejection of, the, of it should not be treated as an isolated issue. Child poverty has been exacerbated ever since they came into power by the way they've dismantled services for children, especially Sure Start. Now, a measure of a civilised society is the way it treats its weakest members. That includes vulnerable children who, because they are hungry, they're unable to learn and play. Judged by this, there is something rotten in the state of the Tory government of Britain today. It is a profound national disgrace that 4.2 million children across the UK are now living in poverty. That means they are either fed or kept warm. We know that children from ethnic minorities are among the most vulnerable to poverty, and also that children in asylum families are greatly at risk of starvation because of the misnamed government support of £5.63 a day. The UN Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights correctly accused the Tories in 2019 of being ideologically driven in its vicious and uncaring ethos on benefits to families in poverty. Since the government came to power in coalition with the Liberal Democrats, it has to be said, in 2010, there's been an increase of 600,000 children in poverty in the UK. But the number of children in poverty and so hungry despite having at least one parent in work, has risen by 52%. And following COVID is now likely to go way beyond the predicted 5.2 million for 2021. That is 
the context in which this government voted against the free school meal bill, which would have meant children some who are starving would have been fed during the uh, half-term holiday. But this isn't a single little blip in the Tories' otherwise compassionate one nation uh, politics. It is a government callousness, consciously done in the full knowledge of the consequences it has for vulnerable children and their families. As a result, along with other formal help we've heard about tonight from community groups, businesses and charities, schools have become the fourth And that's on top of the huge expectation on them to keep schools open and to educate our children. To say a child is starving or a policy is cruel is not a description to be debated. Child hunger and cruel child policies are always wrong and can never be right. The government is wrong in voting to let children go hungry during school holidays. This motion is right in its fight for justice for children who are starving. It's right in its call to lobby the government to feed children in the Christmas holidays and beyond. Please support the motion. Councillor Ashby. Thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, Lord Mayor, first of all, um, I'd like to thank and praise the Red House Farm Juniors Football Club for their efforts in attracting voluntary donations, uh, one from as far away as New York, which enable them to make and deliver via concerned volunteers pack lunches for local children who had need of them. This continues similar community support work they delivered during the summer and they, were, they are already starting to think about the Christmas holidays and the half term next year. We salute and thank you for what you've done Chris, Barry and your team. I must say I was appalled that the £400,000 or so that we have received from government for feeding projects specifically excluded help for those receiving free school meals, which is, has been a long-term Liberal Democrat policy. But Lord Mayor, if a football club can see the need in advance and do something about it, why on earth didn't the administration at the council not see it? Once staff of the Civic were tasked to help, after the Liberal Democrats had demanded action be taken, they were of course as professional and dedicated as we would expect. And thank you to all the volunteer deliverers, including councillors. But because they were dumped on at such short notice, they were only able to reach a small proportion of those who needed help, as we've, as we've heard. The fault for this lies squarely at the door of the Labour Party, to whom it did not occur that more action more quickly was required. Why was this? In the past, we have on this council been told by Labour councillors about holiday hunger. You knew you've got no excuse. You're asleep at the wheel. Wake up, Labour. Holiday hunger isn't going to go away anytime soon. Get your act together and start working towards the next holiday periods so you aren't shown up by the splendid volunteers in the community. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor John Paul Stevenson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It takes a special sort of person when asked the question, do you want to feed children during a global pandemic to respond with no. The incompetence of this government holds no bounds. We have seen organisational and economic incompetence, and now we have seen emotional incompetence. Despite being embarrassed by local businesses, volunteers, councils and sports people, the government have still not committed to funding eligible children over the Christmas period. Perhaps Scrooge Boris needs a visit from the ghosts of Christmas past who tells us that it is the very actions of the coalition government and the subsequent governments which policies cause this poverty. Taking data from the DWP, the Child Poverty Action Group report that between 1998 and 2003, reducing child poverty was made a priority. The number of children in poverty fell by 600,000. However, then, who came along? It was the coalition government. And the Lib Dems failed in their responsibility to tame their Tory overlords. The North East saw the biggest rise in child poverty. 26% by the end of the coalition government. Well done. By 1819, that had risen to 35%. That is a shameful, shameful percentage. 
This council stepped up when government has neglected in its duty to care. What did the Lib Dems do? They got wind at the work of our staff are doing and they put out a quick press release trying to claim credit. They even put some of them, and I'll bear them the courtesy of not naming them, but some of them even put out promotional photos of themselves on social media, which is confusing to the volunteers across our city who are delivering meals without seeking attention for their little out of focus newsletters. Law Mayor, it will cost the government between 20 and 22 million to fund free school meals over the Christmas period. The new private eye highlights the government announced 185 million government consultancy contracts over half term. It's not good enough. We will step up, the, up to the plate if needed, but it's not good enough for government responsibility onto the councils and volunteers. Government must take action. And to end the cruelty of uncertainty, they must take action now. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Stone. Councillor Stone. Yes, can you hear me, Lord Mayor? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, that's better. Right, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I was very pleased to be able to volunteer to help the distribution of free school meals. I'm very disappointed that Councillor Stevenson has chosen to make insinuations in that regard. I spent a lot of time on two days with my colleague going around different parts of the East End, including a number of drops in your wards, Councillor Stevenson. I didn't see you out there doing that. Um, so I think to, to try and score some cheap points in that regard is really, really unfortunate and regrettable. Um, I was pleased to be, um, I, I was pleased to add my appreciation to the work of the volunteers that were out there doing that, that work. I particularly uh, particularly want to add my support for the council catering staff who worked very hard at short notice to um, to, to make that happen. Uh, and I think it is unfortunate to say the least that, that the suggestion was that this, this work was being planned. This work was not planned prior to, prior to this announcement, prior to the, the, the Lib Dems calling for this. We, I think we, we have stung some action out of the out of the council but we talked to the staff uh, about this uh, when we were out there in the um, in the, the banqueting hall it was clear to this clip they were not um, um notified of this until very late on, on friday afternoon and i think that's that tells its own story frankly and i think people should be rather rather careful about what they say and what they allege because i don't think they're telling the truth on that um i think there is um clearly a greater recognition now of the need to tackle holiday hunger. I applaud Marcus Rashford for his role in spearheading this campaign. There is much greater public awareness than there was a few years ago on this. And I hope it's forgivable if I inject one final note of party politics on this that I point out that I point out the, the late, last Labour government did, I admit, introduce breakfast clubs, but it didn't have a policy on meeting holiday hunger um, during during the school holidays. I think it is um, equally true that the coalition did not have a policy on this either. But on this side, we do take a great deal of pride for our efforts in, uh, in helping to introduce universal free school meals for the sevens. That was done only because of the work of the Liberal Democrats and the coalition government. And it was done in the face of bitter and vehement opposition from Michael Gove and from Dominic Cummings. Whatever happened to him, I wonder. I think it's galling to now hear the, the Conservative government claim that free school, that free school meals from the sevens was actually their initiative. It certainly wasn't. That was one thing the Liberal Democrats fought for in coalition. I'm proud. I'm very proud that we did. Councillor Story. Thank you. Um, I had some things planned to say, and I, I now find myself a little bit diverted from what I had planned to say. Um, I think one of the things that we really have to remember here is that children are hungry, not just in the holidays, but they are hungry a lot of the time. And, you know, poverty in the last 10 years has become further entrenched in our society. And last week, 322 Tory MPs voted to deny the most vulnerable children in our society access to food. And frankly, I find myself getting really angry and upset even just thinking about that. We shouldn't be having this conversation, and yet here we are. Frankly, the lack of leadership from government has been cruel 
And yes, it has been overshadowed by a campaign from Marcus Rashford. And yes, the country has been galvanised and has come together and people have done what they do, which is bond. And they have said, no, it's completely unacceptable that children are hungry. There is a backlash and heavy criticism of the government. And I actually feel right now that you know, Newcastle City Council has stepped up to the plate and has really tackled this. And that's really important to recognise that we've done that. Um, despite the fact that government is not providing the right resources to the local authority to enable us to do that, we have stepped up to do it. Um, I would also like to say, you know, whilst my heart absolutely surges, that the very communities who've been hit hardest by the pandemic have risen to this challenge, have gone out there, have offered to volunteer, um, have come up with, you know, all kinds of packages of food from cafes, from businesses who've been massively impacted by this. No child should have to rely on charity. No person should have to do that. I know personally from my own experience when I've had times in my life where I've lived with poverty, where I've been poor, where my children have lived with poverty, relying on charity can feel like it's shameful in some respects. And that's not something that we want any child to live with, frankly. So my heart bursts with pride, but this is not the right thing. What we really need is a government who recognises that our children deserve far better than this, that our children absolutely deserve to have the future um, through, you know, being loved and cared for and fed and feeding a child is showing them love and kindness. Um, I would really like to say that unless we put children at the very heart of every single thing that we do, then we are never going to grow as a society and we absolutely need to do that. I support the motion, but I would really urge people to think very, very carefully about what they're saying around volunteers or who did what or who's going to do what. We need to keep children at the very, very centre of this. And I would urge you all to think about doing that. Thank you. We've had a request from Councillor Taylor to suspend standing orders uh, regarding uh, time of the meeting. Uh, Councillor Robinson has indicated they don't agree to, she doesn't agree to that. Uh, so I will have to take a vote of council. Is, 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 the, uh, is there a seconder for that motion to suspend standing order? Yes, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, is, is, um, I'll not waste time by asking uh, uh, for, a, for a verbal decision. Can you uh, move to your uh, devices? <coughs> it's agreed to suspend standing orders. Yeah. Votes should be on your devices now. Lord Mel, it's not coming up on my tablet. Lord oh. Yeah, Lord Mayor, it's Councillor Wright. I can't get in to vote either. It's not letting me. Nor no mine. Nor me. Okay. Can I ask I to you? Nor me. Just... <coughs> the, the only thing I can do here is if people can't get in, if significant numbers of people can't get into go vote, uh, the only thing I do is to type into this chat. This is unfortunate, I know. Is it agreed to suspend standing orders? Agreed. No. 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 Oh, sorry, sorry. Hello. 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 Oh, we've got it now. That's better. Oh. That's much better. You can see now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, we've got 36 votes there. 
uh, uh, not to suspend standing orders, so that is not agreed. So, uh, well, are we, um, where were we? Councillor Story, if you finish a uh, uh, contribution, we'll move on to Councillor Taylor, please. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, we've actually got a lot of common ground on this uh, issue, although you wouldn't believe it to listen to the debate. Um, but I was very, actually myself very proud to volunteer. Sorry? I was very proud to be one of those volunteers who helped deliver food with parcels on uh, last week. Um, I had some time to do so and uh, I found it very, very good to do that. Um, I, I too was very impressed by the staff. They were very well organised at the Civic Centre and to be honest, putting up a picture of how how well that was going. I didn't really see that that was a problem for social media, so um, I very strongly disagree with Councillor Stevenson about that. What I would say is that um, it could have saved quite a lot of time at a, if there'd been more time prepared to actually have routes for the volunteers. I did actually waste quite a lot of time going back on myself because I didn't don't know every street in um, Walker and, and Biker. Um, and I think if we, if we end up having to do this in the school holidays again, it would help to try and give parcels close together uh, and with a, 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 a suggested route so that volunteers can deliver more. I mean, I was able to deliver about six, six or seven parcels, which took about over an hour to do. Um, you know, perhaps with a bit more planning, volunteers could manage more than that. Um, I do think we're going to have to do this in the school holidays and in Christmas. Um, so I do think we need to start preparing for it now. We all know what our government is like. They're not going to back down on this. Um, it's going to be left to the council again. Uh, so let's be prepared, fully prepared this time. Um, what I would say, though, is I'm very disappointed that we can't debate a solution to this problem that uh, is further on the agenda, which is the introduction of universal basic income. And I think that would go a long way to tackling poverty in this city. Um, if people could guarantee an income coming in, whether they been thrown out of work due to a pandemic or um, they're simply uh, down on their luck. If everybody had that income, they would be able to buy food for their families. And I think that would make a huge difference. And I am disappointed by uh, the, the amendment that Labour are proposing to delay any decision about this for six months. I do think it's something that's whose time has come. It's a very good idea. And I know it has a lot of backing. But on schools, free school meals, Let's try and agree on, on, on the basis of both these motions. We have, are saying the same things. We've both got ideas of how it could be tackled um, by vouchers, etc. What the government could easily do to, to resolve the problem. We just know they're not going to do it. And that's a real shame. And I agree with everyone who said feeding our children is the really most important thing that this city can do. Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I will confess that coming into this debate on free school meals this evening, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say because it's not very often that we see two motions um, on the same subject cleaving so close together um, that are taken together for a debate of this, uh, this nature. Um, I think it is important to stress that on this subject, um, despite some of the um, uh, debate that has, has gone beforehand, there is a lot, a lot more that unites us on this subject and divides us. And it has been fantastic to see the way in which the country and the city has rallied on this subject um, to address the issues of um, holiday hunger and hunger for young people. Um, it was a spectacular own goal by the government, in my view, not to be far more proactive um, in this space and to put organizations at a local level, including the council, in a position of having to react. Um, I'm pleased that um, in the coalition government, the Lib Dems championed free school meals and um, extension of provision of free school meals. And I'm also really proud of Newcastle Lib Dems locally for leading the calls to um, provide free school meals over the holidays. Despite the accusations that were made, we were not aware of any plans um, to um, bring forward free school meals whenever we made the calls for them. Um, and our, our calls were made um, in genuine and good faith. Um, uh, Councillor Taylor is absolutely right um, to say that universal basic income um, could be one part of a solution to the challenges of, of poverty um, and of holiday hunger and of um, a lot of related issues. Um, it is a shame that we aren't getting a chance to um, debate that in greater detail. Um, this evening, but I would urge um, colleagues across the chamber 
to back um, an unambiguous um, stance on universal basic income um, this evening. But I'll finish just by saying, um, you know, there, there has been a lot of debate. There are not very um, many new things to say on this this evening that haven't already been said. But I do entirely agree um, with those that have made it very, very clear this evening that ultimately what we are talking about here is the young people of our city who are going hungry over the holidays and what we can do to support them. And we must come together because ultimately on that subject, I think there is far, far more that unites us than divides us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the guillotine has now fallen. In actual fact, there was no one else that indicated they wanted to speak. But Councillor Cott, you reserve the right to speak. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, and uh, thank you for the contributions of colleagues, uh, in particular Councillor Morrissey. Uh, and I'll also say Councillor Story, because I, I was very moved by uh, what uh, Councillor Story had to say on, on these issues. It is quite clear uh, that on this issue, there is more that unites us than divides us. And this motion is brought in the context in a hugely worrying increase uh, in demand uh, for free school meals in this city, with some 14,000 children, 14,000 children entitled to free school meals. This is a culmination, I think, of rising financial pressure, as has been made clear, and inequality, much exacerbated, I think we will find, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Here is a clear indication, it's one of the major indications of child poverty, free, the, the entitlement to free school meals. And as far as I'm concerned, child poverty is one of the great scourges of our modern society and it must be eradicated. When I was lead member for children's services in this city, we were a beacon for prevention of child poverty and I have always held the back of my mind in all the things I do politically that this is one of the most important things that we could do this is dealing with child poverty is one of the most important things we could do to make a difference to the lives of children and young people that's why we're very much supportive I think everyone here is in the work that Marcus Rashford has undertaken nationally and the support that he has from the Child Poverty Task Force in their cause for an expansion of the free school meal scheme to children whose families are in universal credit. We've heard tonight how we could uh, do more with that if we were a UBI pilot. Maybe we'll have a debate about that another day, but there we are. We note that other authorities have taken up the call to fund a scheme for school meals during holidays until September 2021, which is what we are proposing. And we feel this should be considered by Cabinet. We think there is urgency here. The government is not going to make a positive decision. The government seems not to care sufficiently about this issue. Therefore, we need to take a stance. But we do want the government to take this up. The government has a moral responsibility to do something and we would remind the government of our party's commitment in the coalition to universal free school meals. That was a major issue for us as Councillor Stone has mentioned. Now the other thing we were quite concerned about was how the government misleadingly claimed that monies sent to councils were for free school meal provision but we can't find a line in the North of Tyne funding about that. The government's position here is staggeringly disingenuous. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has opened up major inequalities in our society, and we need to be seen to be taking action. We must invest to improve the health, well-being and achievements of our children and young people. A scheme which is a sticking plaster approach is no good. We need to put the provision in now and lobby the government for a permanent scheme, which actually has cross-party support. There are people in all parties who support this. The Children's Commissioner supports it. There are various professionals, organisations. We need to be at the forefront of doing this. 
One of the issues, and I would say we have, uh, there's been an incredible response locally, but we've heard tonight how if there had been better planning, we might have been able to do a lot more. And I'm sorry, but the council did make a decision very late in the day. I know it's easy to say that in hindsight, but it does highlight the importance of taking action now. So I very much think that this particular motion, our motion that we've brought forward, is, is the most powerful in sending out a message. And I do hope that members of this council will support our motion and support the sentiments that are set inside it. Um, and we'll see that this is the most powerful way of sending a message to refer this to cabinet for further discussion um, and also to take this matter up with the government because the government cannot get off the hook and it's appalling that they're behaving in this way over this very important issue. Let's make, that our, make sure our children in this city have the best life chances and let's tackle inequalities that we can help to control. Let's take action and vote for this motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor McCarthy, you'd also indicate they reserve the right to speak. Thank you very much, um, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm really proud that our council staff team um, turned around uh, and managed a process in a very, very short period of time to ensure that no child went hungry in half term uh, last week. I'm certain that um, and we've heard, Lord Mayor, that we are all angry at the government refusal to support those families who are struggling. Um, and like my colleagues, um, I want to thank those who've been involved in the Toon Army. I want to thank all of the people in the voluntary and community sector um, and the other small businesses across the city who um, voluntarily uh, helped out, helped our families who are struggling. Um, and uh, like the leader of council, said Team Newcastle works hard um, and we're proud of what they achieved. Um, Lord Mayor, there has been, as colleagues have said, a huge increase in the number of children entitled to free school meals. Um, you know, from the beginning of this week, 14,700 pupils entitled to uh, free school meals. Um, many have need, needed that support because their parents have lost their jobs during this pandemic. Um, Lord Mayor, we've heard a lot about late action of the council um, from the opposition councillors tonight. Um, and I would like to put on record that it was nothing to do with their press release. Staff were, or the senior team were certainly working on a solution. Um, and Lord Mayor, we very purposely didn't ask schools to contribute to this because we felt schools have had a really tough half term and all of the staff in schools needed uh, a proper break last week. Um, Lord Mayor, as we know, the significant cuts in universal credit over recent years, as well as 10 years of austerity, has meant that the numbers of children living in poverty has grown. Many of us predicted that, I'm afraid. A third of children in our city, on average, are living, currently living in poverty. Um, in some areas of our city, it's over 40%. In many local areas, it's over 50%. Shocking, shocking statistics. Um, that has resulted in uh, many children in our city being hungry. Um, Lord Mayor, the evidence for that is very, very clear in the recent IPPR report um, and also in the Northeast Poverty Commission report. Um, shocking statistics that we should all be ashamed of in our country, given that we are the fifth or sixth richest country in the world. It is totally unacceptable and deplorable. Um, and Lord Mayor, it is not the promised levelling up uh, that this government have um, made a commitment to. Councillor Cott referred to the £63 million that the uh, government keep quoting. Um, he's absolutely right in his assessment. There was no mention in that of um, providing free school meals in holidays um, for children. Um, and I also agree with colleagues who suggested that we need a properly uh, funded scheme uh, in preparation for Christmas should this rotten government um, you know, choose not to take up the opportunity that Marcus Rashford has given to them. Um, I agree with uh, colleagues uh, in the opposition that there is more that unites us on this motion. But Lord Mayor, we do also need to be honest. And Councillor Schofield talked about what the Lib Dems did in coalition. Lord Mayor, the billions that were cut from um, welfare uh, benefits 
the 122 million each year by 2024 puts more and more families into poverty in our city. Politics does make a difference. That coalition decision was appalling and colleagues in the opposition party here should be ashamed of themselves. Um, Lord Mayor, let's get back to what we might agree on. Um, let's agree to thank all of those people who've been involved, the small businesses, the cafes, the food shops, the voluntary sector organisations, the small community organisations, and indeed the hundreds of people who help their neighbours. Let's let's say a huge thank you to all of those who provided support for children in our city last week. Lord Mayor, let's agree to lobby for a properly funded scheme for Christmas. We can't be doing pat lunches for the Christmas holidays. That just simply will not work. And Lord Mayor, let's also work on a plan B, just in case this rotten government let us down again. Um, no child in our city should be hungry in the Christmas holidays. I support our motion, Lord Mayor. And I call on Councillor Morrissey to reply. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm going to make this very brief because it's been very long and I don't think there's anything really that I can add to this. Um, as a teacher myself, if I was looking at this as a piece of work, I would have said, done well, but could do better. And I think if we take nothing else from, the, from tonight, this is what we have to do. The government isn't going to change. You know, it really isn't. It's made its position clear. And um, it's wonderful having celebrities who are making um, this uh, issue um, wider, you know, sort of more people are aware of it. But we can't rely on anything happening. I think we need to start now. We need to communicate better because the information I was given on the Thursday before half term was that we weren't doing anything for school meals. That could have been a communication error. So in that way, we need to sharpen up our communication and we need to work better with our community groups. But we need to start doing that now. I would like to um, commend my motion to the council. We've got some interference on cell. Will please mute the microphones, please. Councillor Morrissey. Yes, I'll just continue by saying I'd like people to vote for my motion, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Does Council agree Councillor Morris's motion with item 14 on the agenda? Agreed. 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 Right, we, I think we can agree that motion without resorting to go vote. No dissent. So I now call on Councillor Forbes to reply. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And uh, as members have said in the debate tonight, there has been a fair amount of uh, agreement uh, amongst us. There's certainly a, a huge agreement within my group that we've never heard such a load of pompous, self-indulgent hot air from the opposition for a long time. Now, the issue around the free vouchers for the holidays was that the expectation was the government was going to provide them. That was what the campaign that Margaret Rashford led. What happened after that was an outpouring of community support, which was absolutely magnificent. What's muddled, I have to say, in the opposition motion tonight is whether they want the council to simply take over and provide free school meals and holidays in the future, or whether we want to build on that community effort, which is what I want us to do, to make sure that we're coordinating the uh, uh, contributions that people want to make and building a sense of collective coming together as a city to make sure that we look after our city's children. And the thrust of my motion is that dealing with poverty, uh, dealing with holiday hunger is a sticking plaster on a much deeper problem, which is child poverty in this country, which is wholly avoidable and needs to be tackled at root by changes in policies. And those policies were embedded in this country by the coalition government. They were embedded in April 2013 when the coalition government introduced the bedroom tax introduced the benefits cap, 
cut council tax support and uh, cut income tax uh, for the highest paid. It was the coalition government of which the Lib Dems were central that uh, ensured that benefits increases didn't keep up with price rises, pushing families further into poverty. And it was the Lib Dems that uh, were enthusiastic supporters of all of those measures. So we'll take no lessons now from dealing with the consequences of those policies on the streets of Newcastle. And Councillor Cott, you talked about how dealing with child poverty was one of the most important things that we could do. You sat on the ministerial advisory group for children and young people during those coalition years. Where was your voice for our city then? What did you do to change that? You didn't challenge any of those policies. What you left us with was a legacy of poverty that we're now having to pick up the pieces with. We will take no lessons from the Liberal Democrats in how to deal with poverty at root and at cause. You've caused it. We are dealing with it. And that's what this motion is designed to do for the future to ensure that we continue the pressure, continue the campaign for the government to follow through with free school meals, particularly in the Christmas holidays. And yes, as the previous motion says, in other holidays up to next summer too. Yes, let's do that. Let's campaign for that. But let's also make sure that we've got a citywide effort to bring us together, to make sure that uh, we're harnessing the uh, goodwill enthusiasm and generosity of people across this city who want to make a difference. That is what this motion seeks to achieve, in addition to setting us on a course of tackling child poverty forever, which, of course, if we're signed up to the UNICEF Child Friendly City Goals, is something that we should all be working towards, and which I hope, I very much hope, is a policy objective that we would all sign up to. And I therefore urge Council, Lord Mayor, to support this motion unamended. And uh, therefore, does Council agree, uh, Council of Motion, which is item 15 on the agenda? Agreed. 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 I'm not hearing any dissent. Agreed. Okay, motion is agreed. Well, the guillotine has fallen, as we've noticed. Um, uh, we have quite a number of motions to deal with uh, to stand in orders. And uh, uh, what we'll do is the usual procedure. I'll ask the uh, uh, proposer of the motion whether they wish to be ta to take it this evening, or, or, or uh, uh, on on a pure vote, or, or to defer it to another meeting. So, if I could ask Councillor Hudart, uh, what does she want us to do about the motion on trees? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Unfortunately, this was uh, deflected from the previous month, as, as you will remember. So, um, I'd, sorry, it's fireworks going off. Um, you know, I'd, I'd prefer if we could have an agreement on it tonight. <coughs> is, is that seconded? Is the motion seconded? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, Lord Mayor. Yes. Right, I understand there's actually an amendment being proposed uh, for it. Is that the case, Councillor Bell? Councillor Bell? Is anyone proposing the amendment? Move the amendment, Lord Mayor. I'm happy to move it. Well, Bell, are you sure you can do that? Doesn't the person moving a motion or amendment have to be present to do, sir? Well, I've got no indication that Councillor Bell isn't here. Has it, have, are you muted, Councillor Bell? Can he do that? Well, I'm assured that it can be done in that way. So, is anyone seconding the amendment? Seconded. Veronica. Thank you. So, is the amendment agreed? Are we going to have to go, go vote for this? Agreed. Agreed. 
Were you asking me agreed. if I, I agreed to the amendment? Please. I wasn't sure if you asked me that. No, 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 ask Councillor Hoddart. Yes, Councillor Hoddart, are you agreeing to the amendment? Yes, I'm just disappointed I didn't get a chance to talk about the 17,500 destruction of trees in Sheffield, which I would like to have mentioned. I have now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes, I way to school, Is the yeah, amended motion agreed then? Agreed. 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 Thank you, colleague. Agreed. agreed. We move on to item 17, which is the motion which has already been referred to on a universal basic income. Councillor King, do you wish to defer this or take it this evening? Uh, take it this evening, Lord Mayor, and uh, the uh, amendment is not a friendly one, so we will vote on that. Too, little, well. too late. Is the motion second? Lord Mayor. Councillor Woodock. Is that Councillor Woodock? Already noticed. It's, it's, it's on a different path, Lord Mayor. Yes, yeah, so I think that. Yes, we've got that. I'm afraid I have a, a, a little tablet popped up over my screen and I can't see that. I've, I've moved it now. Um, right, so where are we? Um, the amendment has not been accepted. Is the amendment proposed? Councillor Cairns, are you proposing this amendment? Yes, I am. Is seconded? Anyone seconding the amendment? I'll second. I'll second Councillor Higgins. Okay, thank you. So it wasn't agreed. So we'll have to go to a vote on the uh, on the amendment to the motion. And that will be coming up now. Is the amendment agreed? Lord May, I still can't vote, so can I register that I'm agreeing to the amendment, please? Yes, Councillor Wright. Yes, can we note that, Councillor Wright, please? And and can I can I register? I can't get in either. Can I register that I disagree with the amendment? Councillor Bell as well. I've managed to get back on. I'm having problems. <laughs> right. Well, with, with, the, the amendment is is uh, um, is agreed, so it becomes the substantive motion. Uh, is the, the amended motion agreed? Agreed. 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 I'm, I'm not hearing any. Agreed. So agreed. As amended, is agreed. Yeah. Move on to uh, motion 18, which is on protecting leisure services in the city. Councillor Barnes, do you wish this to be deferred or taken this evening without debate? Um, can we take this tonight, um, please, Lord Mayor? Uh, is, the, is it seconded? Yeah, seconded, Councillor Davis. Right. Is this uh, is this motion agreed? Agreed. 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 So the motion is agreed. Agenda item 19 is the note of the motion smoke free. Councillor Ali, do you wish this to take be tonight, please? Right. Take tonight, please. Anybody seconding it? Seconded, Lord Mayor. Is the motion agreed? Agreed. 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 Not agreed. In, not in any dissent. No, the motion is agreed. And uh, agenda item 20. Uh, on COVID-19, uh, Councillor Taylor, do you wish it to be taken this evening? Yes, taken tonight, please. Okay. Is it seconded? Seconded, Lord Mayor. Councillor Ali. Thank you. Uh, is the motion agreed? Agreed. 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 
So the motion is agreed. I'm about to be signed out, it says onto my computer. I've got 10 minutes, it says. <laughs> <laughs> Just about to get on. <laughs> <laughs> 21 the exam battle. Uh, um, um, Councillor Holland. Yes, can we take it tonight? Yeah. Uh, the the councillor is it seconded? Um, yes, I second that, Lord Mayor. Uh, uh, there's no amendment put down. Uh, so is the motion agreed? Agreed. 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 So that motion is also carried. And the final item on the agenda is item uh, 52, no motion on West End Pool. Councillor Donaldson, can I ask if you wish this to be deferred or put on without debate this evening? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would like to defer till the next meeting. Thank you very much. So that is the agenda. Uh, So at that point, I'll close the meeting without any further ado. It's gone off. It's gone off. Uh, so <laughs> the next virtual meeting will actually be on the 6th of January 2021. So may I take this opportunity to wish everyone all the best for the festive period. We <laughs> hope this will be better than the one that's passed. Uh, and I ask you all to stay safe and by the time again. We may know who the next president of the United States is going to be. <laughs> Good night, colleagues. Thank Good you, night. Good night, everyone.